Peace and blessings, everyone. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep, with the Madhu Andela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. I am happy to be with you today, this Sunday, June 28th, uh, 2020. And it's been a second uh, since I've, you know, done a, a full lecture. So today, um, getting back on my original content, uh, so to speak. So we've been having a series of dynamic interviews, which will continue throughout the summer. Um, but for now, I want to take the time to address a, an academic argument uh, concerning the ancient Egyptian language. And so you know, in the most recent past, there has been some controversy concerning Jean-Claude Emboli's argument that Middle Egyptian and Coptic are two separate languages. And there's a lot of misinformation that had been circulating um, at the time of these initial arguments. And everyone who attempted to argue against it, never read Jean-Claude and Boley's work because they were making arguments that weren't even being made. For example, that Coptic is not an Egyptian language. And so you you heard that from the likes of Ned or Neb or Dr. Mario Beatty. Uh, none of them had actually read Jean-Claude and Boley's work. And so they never understood the arguments. And so you know, this has been a long time in the making. And originally, I intended for our good brother Jean-Claude Emboli to do this lecture himself on the channel. But um, given the time constraints and, you know, all that he's got going on now, uh, you know, it would be a, a minute before he was able to come on and and do that so i decided to you know with his blessing um do the lecture instead and so as i have spoken of in the description this is going to be a full lecture this is this lecture here is intended for you know the student to come back and review the information in chunks and so this lecture may be you know, in between two to three hours. So um, what I'm going to do, the, the actual lecture, of course, is broken up into sections. So when this lecture is done, I'm going to go back and put the timestamps in the description so that, uh, you know, those are coming to review. It's easier to find the, the, the sections where you left off or whatnot. And I may just, you know, even chop up the video and, and upload it in different um, uh, components. 
uh, probably like two or three different uh, videos in one. So this is just intended to be, you know, a uh, a, a full lecture. Um, it's going to be a, a good number of details. And so uh, I hope that you have your pen and paper ready. Or if you take notes on your your computer, that you you have that open and ready that you have a drink or something. You know, I have my Arizona tea uh, here and some water. And, you know, if you have any snacks, it would be good to have it. So as always, I'd like to thank those who um, are listening live on this Sunday. So uh, and who have made themselves known in the chat. So peace and love to Brother Robert Rand, to Vyasa uh, Gula, to Majay Alboabab. Uh, OG Gorilla in the building, Brother Aziz Fall, Brother Chavez. Uh, we have Rafael Ara uh, out of Brazil. I see you. Uh, Thomas McLean and Cheryl Ann Jones. So, uh, of course, I am streaming live. Uh, okay. Uh, I have to decline you. That's our good brother, Sinjetti. Um, and <laughs> so uh just want to say peace and blessings to everyone and uh thank you for joining so this is going to be the beginning of the program so i'm just trying to make sure that everything is on the up and up there okay so without further ado because we have a lot to cover I am going to get started, but before I get started, just want to remind you all to please like the video, please share the video on your uh, social media platforms, and uh, you can even, want, you know, at least on Facebook, have a watch party, you know, for the video, and uh, I see Shesmu Pata is in the building, thank you for joining us, and uh, I appreciate, you know, everyone who has supported uh, financially the uh, the program, you know, in the past. And if you want to continue to uh, support the program, you can, if you are on YouTube, you could uh, support it by hitting the little money sign in the chat, um, or you can send it directly through uh, Cash App. And so that information should be in the description, uh, dollar sign Asarm Hotep. And so your contributions, you know, allow me to keep the channel going as well as, you know, help to bring in certain of the, the big name guests that we have. So I appreciate all of the help that you have given. And so thank you all. And so with that being said, I am going to get started. So let me share my screen real quick. There we go. Let me pull up the lecture title and let me make sure that everything is showing correctly on the various screens. And so I'm getting confirmation on Facebook and I am getting confirmation on the YouTube. So we are good to go. <clears throat> so today's lecture is titled Coptic and Middle Egyptian as separate languages, uh, diving deep into the Mboli model. And that's Jean-Claude Mboli. And so much of this is discussed in Aluja Volume 2, China Into Religion and Philosophy, and which is on sale right now on my website. And so for those of you who don't have the book yet, if you go to Amazon.com and purchase it, it's going to be $45. But if you go to my website, AsarmHotep.com, to purchase, it is on sale right now for $30. So uh, if you have not gotten the text, I would encourage you to go to the website and get it while the, uh, it is discounted. 
And other aspects of this conversation is going to be in towards a comparative dictionary of Qigong in modern African languages, which is also sold on my website. So uh, these are, you know, two of the main references. And we will just continue. So we have a number of objectives today, and that is to discuss Mboli's Negro Egyptian model and then provide details and clarity to the argument that Coptic and Middle Egyptian are in fact separate languages and dispel the myths concerning the central argument. So as I mentioned before, you have a whole bunch of people trying to make arguments against Jean-Claude Mboli's conclusion, but they've never read Mboli's work and then therefore misconstrued his arguments. And so uh, I want to bring clarity to the essential arguments of our good brother in bowling and, uh, you know, get rid of those, that misinformation concerning uh, the text. So we continue with some essential arguments. So why is this discussion even important in the first place? It is because the general opinion of Egyptologists everywhere is that the ancient Egyptian language is a singular language that is the only language uh, within the so-called Afroasiatic language phylum that represents you know its own branch of Afroasiatic, and not only that, that it that the last stage of the language, which we have you know over three thousand years of recorded history of the language, uh, is the Coptic language. That the last stage is the Coptic language, and so that is the general opinion. And so there is an ev a linear evolution coming from the old kingdom. Middle Egyptian, New Kingdom, Demotic, and Coptic. And so usually when you hear the, or you read the, in the Egyptological literature, you will see that they break up the languages into these five states, uh, so to speak. And so Old Kingdom, Middle Egyptian, or as you say, Old Egyptian, Middle Egyptian, New Egyptian, and New Kingdom Egyptian, Demotic, and Coptic. And so the Demotic and Coptic also come with their own scripts. So you'll also hear Demotic and Coptic in reference to the, an actual writing script. So uh, keep that in mind. And so some of the reasons why they believe that this is the case, that there is a single path from Old Kingdom Egyptian to Coptic, it is based on vocabulary and the general geography and then the typology of the language itself and also that coptic was used in the decipherment of the hieroglyphs so the expectation is that since coptic was used to decipher the hieroglyphs that this must be the later stage of the the earlier branches and that is not enough to make the argument that uh <laughs> hold on one sec okay so they make the argument that uh this is the case without doing any work so a lot of people don't really even really realize that you know although coptic was used to you know reveal some of the hieroglyphic letters and things you know, it, it really didn't help to decipher, for example, late Egyptian and middle Egyptian. There were some other stages of this process that had to happen before really middle Egyptian and things were fully deciphered. And so that's another conversation for another time. But, you know, there tends to be this kind of lackadaisical and laziness when it comes to the Egyptological history and, and language studies, which is, is very sad on one end. Um, and, you know, it, it, 
it has blocked a lot of understanding of the ancient Egyptian language and culture in general. So, you know, this is why the works of Sheikh Antijot, of Tiff Alabenga, of Jean-Claude Mboli, of Omendiji, Modupe Odioye, et cetera, et cetera, are very important in terms of this conversation. So, uh, so we hope to do, you know, the language and, and some things, some justice uh, here today. So the, the first segment of this conversation is the historical context. So why should we even entertain the idea that Coptic could possibly be a separate language from Middle Egyptian and not simply a later continuation of the Middle Egyptian language? So that's what we are going to discuss here. And so a lot of this I've already discussed in the Nesubiti King in Ancient Egyptian, a lesson in Paranimian leadership text that was released in 2016. So uh, you can get, uh, if you don't have this text, you can get, uh, you know, some more details in this text. And a lot of it was repeated in the Chikam book, the Towards a Comparative Dictionary of Chikam in Modern African Languages, with a little bit more details there. So if you don't have that text, uh, you can get it in either one of those texts. So let's just start off with an analysis made by Dr. Riketi Amin. And this is from an article that she wrote in, or at least published in 1986, called The Unity of African Languages. <laughs> and in this text, she's talking about the different stages of the Egyptian language. Now, keep in mind that she is a, a traditional Egyptologist in this sense as it regards the ancient Egyptian language. So she says these designations in terms of the so-called stages of the Egyptian language however, reflect not so much stages in the development of Egyptian language per se as rather stages in the evolving political history of the various dynasties. What Sir Alan Gardner called late Egyptian was the dialect of Upper Kemet, traces of which were already noticed in the Old Kingdom in Upper Kemetic sites. In dynasties 6 through 11, the vernacular called Middle Egyptian was predominant in Kemet. During the first intermediate period, this dialect spread northward by the late 11th dynasty and early 12th dynasties. So-called late Egyptian forms occur on all types of monumental inscriptions. When the Nubian regime gained power in the 25th dynasty, excuse me, in the 18th dynasty, the vernacular of Upper Kemet spread with the establishment of the new kingdom. Amenhotep II composed a letter to his viceroy in Nubia, and in it he used what has come to be called late Egyptian. In other words, his language was that of Nubia or Upper Egypt. And so to kind of put that in context, Amenhotep II is from the 18th dynasty. So when they talk about the New Kingdom language, what they're really talking about is the 19th dynasty onward. So when, when you when you start talking about the language of Ramesses II, of you know Akhenaten, you know, or Amenhotep uh the fourth or whatever, and you know, King Tut, et cetera. So from from that period on in the 19th dynasty is the new kingdom language, but prior to that is the middle kingdom language. And we'll see some call even in this period uh, neo-middle uh, Egyptian or something to that nature. And so, so what she's saying here is that during this time, during the 18th dynasty, he Amenhotep II sends a letter to Nubia in the quote-unquote New Kingdom language. So before the New Kingdom even begins we already have evidence of the New Kingdom uh, language and or dialect. So that's what she's saying here. 
So that's going to be very important in the, in this conversation to understand. So um, so now we know for a fact that it, the late Egyptian could not have evolved directly from Middle Egyptian. Because while Middle Egyptian was still being spoken, Late Egyptian was also being spoken in a different geographical region. And so if this is something that you have to understand about languages and how they evolve. So you don't have in a language situation that there is, for example, a mother tongue or a mother stage of a language that that exists independently while its daughter languages or dialects evolve in a different direction that's not how it works the mother tongue evolves into its daughters so if the late egyptian evolved from middle egyptian you know um it would be a singular line and continuum they wouldn't exist side by side together and so that's something that you have to keep in mind. So we also have this other testimony from um, this Egyptologist and Coptologist in an article, the, the History and Literature of the Ancient Egyptian and Coptic Languages, uh, Bulas Ayad Ayad, who's a professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado. So in this article, he makes this following statement. <coughs> Excuse me. Some scholars hold that the ancient Egyptians had another language in addition to the written form. Father Shenouda Mahir summarized the opinion of Chain, which is another author, concerning the popular na national language of ancient Egypt. And I have in bold it, in which he emphasizes that the Egyptian and Coptic languages have been together simultaneously since olden times. Chain has presented a copious and detailed study and has indicated that the Egyptian language is not a spoken language is so far as it is basically derived from Coptic, assuming that Coptic is the origin and that the Egyptian language was used by the priests and the scribes in their written work only. This means that Egyptian language is the language of the Egyptian who spoke in Coptic and who used this language for scriptural purposes only. This Egyptian language was only known to the scribes and totally unknown to the public. So in, in his argument, what he's saying is that, that the general population spoke the Coptic language but only the administrators and the priests are the ones who spoke and written in Egyptian. And so these are two separate languages in written writing scripts that existed simultaneously, as they were saying. But in, in this argument, you know, he's saying that the middle, the, like, for example, the middle Egyptian uh, evolved out of the Coptic. And so it's a, it's a different, uh, diachrony here um, in this particular argument. But the important point here is that at least for this author, the Coptic language and the Egyptian language were existed simultaneously since the Old Kingdom. And that the Coptic language was the language of the general population. Not this didn't, it didn't begin in later on in history. So, you know, and I, I discuss and expand upon this more in the Nesubiti text. So we then we have another linguist and Egyptologist by the name of Helmut, Helmut Satzinger. And he wrote a, an article, The Egyptian Connection, Egyptian and the Semitic Languages. And so in this article, he states, historical Egypt is constituted of two populations that of the Delta and that of the Nile Valley. Most probably these groups had different languages and it is only one of them that is the ancestor of historical Egyptian. At present, many assume that Proto-Egyptian is the language of the Southerners. 
We know nothing at all about the other language. So he's saying here that, so now this person is assuming at minimum two languages. And he gives a different geographical setting for these two languages. So in the in our modern day South is the origin of the Egyptian. We're talking about Old Kingdom, Middle Egyptian. And that uh, the other, so he doesn't, he doesn't make the argument like the other author made um, concerning Coptic. But so he's just saying that there's an, there was more than likely an unknown language in the Delta region. And so this is going to be very important. So remember, we're setting the stage. And so people like to believe that, you know, we're out of our mind for even suggesting that Coptic and Middle Egyptian are separate languages. And we're saying that this is in alignment with the scholarship and what we know about the various languages that existed um, in Egypt during uh, the developmental stages and throughout its history. So he continues <laughs> to, and, and reminds us that the valley population is not indigenous. It has immigrated either from the south or from the southwest. The implications of this question concern the languages with which Egyptian may have had contact before it entered the light of history. So this is something else that you have to remember. The, the pharaonic originators, in terms of the language and the script, these people were not native, quote-unquote, Egyptians. <laughs> so the they are imposing themselves on a native population and so this native population speaks a totally different language it could be a related language to the old kingdom and middle kingdom uh egyptian but it's a separate language nonetheless so it's just like when the british came here to the united states you know, the the English language is is not native to this land. So you have different, you know, ethnic groups that stayed here originally who spoke Choctaw, or what we call Alcoquian or Cherokee, et cetera, et cetera. And so the as a result, the English language becomes the prestige language because they're the dominant group. They may not be dominant in terms of numbers, at least in this initial stage of American history, but because they have the power and the prestige, the writings and everything is going to be in English and, and not the underlying all these other languages which were native here. And so we have to keep that in mind. <laughs> and so the Egyptian text informs us that this is in fact the case. And so we have textual evidence for that. So there's a New Kingdom text that is, is called the Tale of Sanuhe. And this is a tale in which, you know, there's a native Egyptian who finds himself in the Middle East and is desiring to come back home, right? And, you know, and so he wants to die and be buried in Egypt in his native land instead of uh, uh, dying and being buried in the Middle East. And so we have these two separate concepts that are uh, told in this story. So let's read the first one on the left. He says, I do not know what sundered me from my place. It was like a dream, as if a man of the Delta were suddenly to see himself in Elephantine. So if you know the geography of Egypt, you know the Delta is in the extreme north of Egypt. And then Elephantine is to the south, 
which is almost bordering modern Sudan. And so he's he's letting you know that these are <laughs> almost two different countries to uh, Sanuhe. So it's like, you know, he, he was in such a foreign place that it seems as if you took a person who is native to the Delta region and then uh, they found themselves in, in southern Egypt, uh, <laughs> excuse me, in southern Egypt in Elephantine. So they're two different, you know, areas. So it's like if, if, for example, if someone said, you know, it's like a person from New York finding themselves in the Arizona desert. Like it's, it's a vastly different geography, uh, so to speak. But they goes on to say that there's not just a geographical distance or, or, or difference, that this is also reflected in the languages of the area. So we read on the right, your speeches are gathered together on my tongue and remain upon my lips. They are confused when heard and there is no interpreter who can unravel them. They are like the words of a man of the Delta Marshes with a man of Elephantine. So let's, let's reread that and, and put it into context here. Your speeches are gathered together on my tongue and remain upon my lips, meaning your languages you know, I, I, they're, they're embedded in me. I can speak these languages. But they are confused when heard. And there is no interpreter who can unravel them. So the different languages in which he's talking about, you would need an interpreter, meaning they don't understand each other. So, you know, if, if you know, I need an interpreter to speak, you know, Key Congo if I go into the Congo region. You know, they... They may not understand my English, and I won't understand their uh, Kikongo. So when I go there, I would need an interpreter, somebody who either speaks French or, you know, of course, the native Kikongo. So, <laughs> so this is what he's saying here. So he's like, they are like the words of a man of the Delta Marshes with a man of Elephantine. So in linguistics, how we determine if two languages are, two related languages are in fact different languages or dialects of a single language is the intelligibility test. And that is, is the language, are these different dialects mutually intelligible? Meaning, can I understand? them so like when i go to new orleans back home to new orleans you know uh we speak differently in new orleans than the general country at large but it's not hard for anybody out in cali or wyoming to understand people in new orleans it's all english it's just a different dialect of english but that's a totally different thing when, for example, if I was to go into the hills of Jamaica and, you know, the and, and listening to the kind of Jamaican, even though they generally use English words in Jamaican, that, you know, it would be hard for an English speaker to understand these children of the Maroons who, who found themselves in the mountains in Jamaica. Because the language has evolved uh, so much that it's unintelligible to most of us here in the United States. So we would have to consider that now at this point, separate languages. So by the time of this speech, he's acknowledging here at least two different languages that were spoken in ancient Egypt. So, you know, we go back to. Uh, Dr. Satzinger, 
He says historical Egypt is constituted of two populations, that of the Delta and that of the Nile Valley. Most probably these groups had different languages, and it is only one of them that is the ancestor historical Egyptian. At present, many assume that Proto-Egyptian is the language of the Southerners. So we remember that the valley population is not indigenous. It has immigrated either from the south or from the southwest. The implications of this question is concerning the languages which Egyptian may have had contact before it uh, entered the light of history. So you have a group of immigrants coming from the south. So that south, remember, Elephantine is in the south. So they're saying that the Delta language and the, uh, the southern languages are totally different languages. <laughs> so there's a text excuse me one second there's a text that was published in 1999 called Egyptian Phonology an introduction to the phonology of a dead language by Karstein Pust and you know he's a traditional Egyptologist uh, but he provides some clues unwittingly that supports our general hypothesis, even though he doesn't necessarily word it in the way that I'm articulating this today. So he says here uh, concerning the Egyptian language, from about 1300 BC on, remarkable linguistic differences can be observed on a synchronic level. Text can either be written in a somewhat archaic language based on Middle Egyptian or in a more informal language, which probably reflects the contemporary spoken tongue. The former is called Neo-Middle Egyptian, the latter Late Egyptian. The gap between Neo-Middle Egyptian and Late Egyptian is considerable in both the grammatical and the lexical uh, respects. Let me read that again and slow it down. The gap between... Middle Egyptian and Late Egyptian is considerable in both the grammatical and the lexical respects, so as to justify a classification as two different languages. So he's saying here that even though they in general believe that uh, Coptic you know, is a natural evolution of demotic and demotic is a natural evolution of new kingdom. And that new kingdom evolves from Middle Egyptian. What he's saying here is that the differences in the grammar and lexicon is so great that you would have to, that you would be justified in considering these are two separate languages. So we have to keep that in mind. <clears throat> so on the same page in a footnote, <clears throat> footnote number five is what I have highlighted here. So for example, the Egyptian, uh, for example, the definite article per or pa which is a typical late Egyptian feature, is already found a few times in the Old Kingdom, but only in utterances ascribed to lower class people and as parts of proper names. Let me repeat this. So remember what, we, what he just said earlier, that there's a difference between Middle Egyptian and Late Kingdom uh, Egyptian, and that the differences are great enough that you can justify the argument that these are two separate languages. So uh, this number five uh, is, is to another point that he made previously, but this is applicable to the point which we just cited. And he says the definite article, pa, you know, or, you know, in English, the definite article is the. So an indefinite article would be a. So when I when I say the man over there, the man is the, the definite article, the. If I say a man in general, that is an indefinite article. So 
this definite article, Pa, which is not a part of the Old Kingdom or Middle Kingdom uh, grammar. This is a New Kingdom grammar. But you have evidence of this in the Old Kingdom, but only in utterances ascribed to the lower class people and as parts of proper names. So remember what we said earlier, that the Old Kingdom and Middle uh, Kingdom speakers, the ruling class, are invaders. And so the lower class people would be the people who are indigenous to the Nile Valley. So when the, the scribes who speak Middle Egyptian, Old Kingdom Egyptian, are recording the sayings of the lower class, because, of course, if you are an invader, your group is going to be the upper class. So the lower class people are the indigenous people in the Nile Valley. So if once they started recording their speeches, they noticed in their speech this definite article pa. And it doesn't show up again in, in, in a very systematic way into the new kingdom, 19th dynasty and 18th dynasty. So remember that Amenhotep II was writing to Nubia and they were using the late kingdom language. So this just demonstrates again that the late kingdom Egyptian was already being spoken in the old kingdom. And so if late Egyptian and old Egyptian and middle Egyptian were being spoken of at the same time, then, then late Egyptian cannot be the natural evolution from old kingdom Egyptian. And so this is this is half how we have to you know um understand these things. So we're seeing the you know and we're not even getting into details of Coptic itself, we're just giving you the historical context that would allow for us to even make that suggestion that Coptic could be a separate language from Middle Egyptian. And so he continues, in addition to the diachronic variation, the linguistic situation in Egypt has been characterized by considerable diastratic differentiation during most of all or all periods. We can actually say that multilingualism, multilingualism has played a greater role in Egypt than in many modern Western societies. In modern Egypt, Two distinct varieties of Arabic, which show pronounced differences on all linguistic levels, are the main vehicles of spoken and written communication, respectively. A similar situation existed during all or most of the Pharaonic era, where even in certain periods, two or more linguistically distinct varieties of Egyptian were in use for different types of written communication. Moreover, two or more distinct writing systems were in use throughout the entire Pharaonic era. In addition to the existence of different linguistic varieties of Egyptian itself, we have to consider that Egyptian experienced intense contact with other languages of various genetic affiliation. It can be assumed that there have always been a considerable number of Egyptians who, besides knowing one or more varieties of Egyptian, were familiar with one or several neighboring languages. As a result of such contacts, mixed languages of various types arose, such as Coptic, with basically Egyptian grammar, but a high and sometimes dominating ratio of foreign vocabulary. Or Napatan, with basically Egyptian vocabulary, but profound grammatical restructuring due to contact with African languages. And so for Puce, the, the Napatan language is the language of the 25th dynasty. Uh, so that Cushitic dynasty. Um, and, and we should know that the Cushitic the Kushite people spoke a so-called Nilo-Saharan language. And um, so that's a conversation for a different time. But for Pust here, he's making the analogy that like when you go into modern Egypt today, 
there's two different varieties of Arabic that is spoken in in modern Egypt. So what he's trying to argue is that 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 was the same thing in ancient Egypt, that there is these different varieties of the same language being spoken at the same time. And so my argument is that they're not necessarily varieties of the same language, but two at minimum, two different languages that were related languages that were being spoken of in um, ancient Egyptian uh, history, throughout ancient Egyptian history and in the geographical space. So that's the kind of the departure point between, you know, myself and Mboli and anyone who agrees with the Obinga and Mboli model. So this is some some very, you know, interesting things here that we have to keep in mind. And so the situation, this is what I wrote in uh, essentially the Nesabiti book and in Aluja volume two, but directly um, from Aluja volume two. And this is the what happened in uh, this one. This actually is a citation from Nesabiti <laughs> of what happened in uh in ink or the the british isles i should say and so what i say here is that and and i'm talking i'm giving this as an analogy of what happened in ancient egypt and so it is no different than what happened in the 11th century normandy invasion and occupation of england by duke william ii during this time period a little after uh 1072 a.d the norman french is introduced as the language of the new elite the general population spoke English, but the language of education and writing was French. This explains why approximately 30% of our English vocabulary is actually French words. Only after the expulsion of the French from England was English re-adopted as the language of prestige and writing. I argue here that this is more than likely what happened in ancient Kemet. And so um, what I put here is in, the, uh, in terms of the footnote is French legal, military, and political terminology, uh, words for meat of an animal, noble words, words referring to food, etc. For example, au gratin. Nearly 30%, of course, of English words in an 80,000-word dictionary may be of French origin. And then you can see this text for a discussion of that history. Uh, the Origins of English Language, a Social and Linguistic History, <laughs> uh, published in 1986. So this is important to note because, you know, what is 30% of 80,000 words? That's 24,000 words. So 24,000 words in the English language are from French. And so we... <sighs> Uh, I have to decline, sister. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for the noise, y'all. But <laughs> the ooh, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so the twenty four thousand words of French origin in the English language. This is important to note because when people talk about the continuum of the so-called evidence that Coptic evolved naturally from Middle Egyptian, one of the things that they cite is the uh, large amount of Coptic words that you can find in the uh, Middle Egyptian language. And that doesn't necessarily mean anything because Coptic if we argue that Coptic, you know, is a separate language, but a related language to Middle Egyptian, you have um, at minimum two scenarios here. So those words that match with Middle Egyptian could be bought, not borrowed, but inherited from the pre-dialectical parent that gave birth to both Middle Egyptian and Coptic. But then you also have the situation because Coptic speakers were living in the same proximity as Old Kingdom of Middle Egyptian speakers, that they could have borrowed those terms from the prestige language folks. And 
you would have a whole bunch of that because the the old kingdom middle egyptian rulers had ruled for such a long time until about the late kingdom and so the late kingdom given our scenario here would be now you having native rulers re reestablishing themselves after the second intermediate period in um in egypt and so we have to keep these things in mind <laughs> so one of the ways that you can tell that you know either two languages are present or there was some heavy contacts in a language group is when you start seeing doublets in the language for very basic words so here's a few examples here so i have this table with five columns in a number of rows and each one of the columns you know are, are just different words for the same item in the Egyptian language. And so if if this evolved naturally, we would not have these different words for the same thing. So the the word for face and facing, we have in variety A, chenet. Then you have variety B, her. Then you have the word for head, so you have tep, and then you have jer jer. Then you also have jinnet, and then you have resh, which is late Egyptian, which actually may be a borrowing from Semitic. And then we have the word for heart. So you have harti, and then you have id. Then you have the word for penis or phallus, mit. Then you have beh. And then you have hinen, and then you have mitur. Different words all together. And so you can see like the word for the, to, to suckle, which becomes a word for wet nurse as a result of the uh, T suffix. But you have minahet, and then you have sinquiet, or sinquit, ta, or whatever. And so the word for grow old, ir, and irik. Then you have wit or ot. Then you have simsu. And so these are all, and we can go on and on, but you see that these are totally different varieties of the same word and concepts. And so when you think about even in, in English, like, you know, we have the word um, chief in English, but the word chief in English is a borrowing. It is a word that means head, but our native word is head. Or when you say capital, you know, capital is another borrowing into English. It's another root that means head. It's, it's the same root that gives us the word chief. Chief is the palatalized uh, variant of the, the root that gives us capital. So when you, when you understand these, when the borrowings, well, how did we get these? And these are coming from Latin. And so, of course, we get them from French. And matter of fact, we get them from French and Latin because, you know, uh, our education system likes to use Latin and Greek words, you know, for, for various concepts. So you have voluntary borrowing and then you have the involuntary borrowing as a result of the French speakers who invaded Normandy in uh, the early part of the, the last millennium, um, you know, that being the prestige language. So we have a whole bunch of doublets in the English language. Remember, we have at minimum 24,000 French words. And so that's not including, because it's, uh, as I asked, uh, or one author estimated, maybe 80, up to 80% of the English language, the vocabulary is borrowed vocabulary. So, you know, we're dealing with French on one hand, then you have Latin on another, then you have Celtic on another, then you have, um, uh, of course, a lot of Greek words. And then, of course, you have some Native American words 
and, and African, but those are on a smaller scale in comparison to the other Indo-European languages from which the English language has borrowed. You know, it's only the grammar that really informs us that English is a Germanic language. So, uh, Lepsius, in his 1837 work, states that one of the most obvious differences between the sacred dialect and, and we're talking about the hieroglyphs, so we're talking about Middle Egyptian, etc., and the Coptic language is that the majority of the grammatical affixes want suffix to substantives or nouns and verbs are found to be prefixed in the Coptic language, a linguistic phenomenon that repeatedly occurs throughout all languages. And so what they're saying here is typologically that, you know, you even notice a difference in, in how the, the suffixes and, and prefixes, you know, are handled in Coptic versus the Middle Egyptian. So all of those suffixes in Middle Egyptian are really prefixed in Coptic. And that has a major, uh, that has major implications on sound change and things to that nature, as we will discuss uh, later on in this conversation. So I will continue. So now we're going to our second segment and I'll be explaining uh, Negro Egyptian a bit. <laughs> so, so remember the first half or the first part of the conversation, we're talking about just the general context in which, you know, we have grounds to suspect that, that e Egyptian, Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom Egyptian was not the only language being spoken in Egypt at that time. And that there were other languages and one of the native languages that was being spoken there was Coptic. And that Coptic was the language of the lower class people, the original people of the, the, the Nile Valley and the Delta. So as mentioned before, you know, uh, that the concept of Negro Egyptian originates with Dr. Teofalo Binga. And this book right here, The Common Origin of Ancient Egyptian, of Coptic, and Modern Negro African Languages, an introduction to African historical linguistics. And this was published in 1993 in French. And in it, you know, he, one of his major, Arguments is that the Afro-Asiatic language phylum is a non-existent phylum. And he went about to reorganize African languages. And so on this column, these two columns here on the right column, you see the standard, you know, argumentation, which originates in Greenberg, 1963, uh, introduction to African languages. And this is Afrasian or Afroasiatic, Nilo Saharan, Niger Cardiphonian, and Khoisan, and Niger Cardiphonian being Niger Congo. And so, but for Obinga, he, he divides African languages into three languages, three language groups. You had the Berber language, the Negro Egyptian language, and Khoisan. So, Berber in the Greenberg model belongs to Afrasian. And so Afrasian consists of Egyptian, Berber, Chadic, Omotic, Cushitic, and the Semitic languages. So what Obinga does is he takes out Semitic and doesn't even include it into the African languages, argues that Berber is an African language, but it's a separate language family. And then there's Negro Egyptian and then Khoisan. So Negro Egyptian are the other languages that were included in the Afroasiatic minus Berber and Semitic. So this includes Chadic, this includes Omotic, this includes Cushitic. And also the Nilo Saharan languages and the Niger Kordofanian languages or Niger Congo languages. So 
<laughs> that's how Theophilo Bingo organized his Negro Egyptian. So then comes Jean Claude Emboli in his uh, text, The Origin of African Languages, that this analysis, you know, isn't all the way right because the same issues that plague Afro-Asiatic also plague Nilo Saharan and Niger uh, Congo. So you can't include Nilo Saharan and Niger Congo into your Negro Egyptian because the same methods that built Afro-Asiatic are the same ones that built Nilo Saharan and Niger, uh, Niger Congo. So if the same methods are not good enough for Afro uh, to establish Afro-Asiatic, it can't be good enough to establish Nilo Saharan or Niger Congo. And so this is this is problematic when it comes to the defense of Negro Egyptian under Obinga 1993. So that's why Jean-Claude Mboli, you know, he dispenses with all of the uh, the previous labels brought together by Greenberg. And he just starts from scratch. And, you know, he builds, he, he builds on Dr. Theophilo Binga's 1993 work and verifies the relationship, for example, between, you know, Bantu, because Obinga was comparing primarily his native language of Mbochi, which is a Bantu language, with ancient Egyptian and Coptic. And so, uh, and then, you know, of course, Sheikh Antetidop did the same thing with Wolof. And so, but jean Colin Boli was trying to do the same thing with his native language of Sango and Zande. And so uh, his parents, one spoke natively Sango and one spoke natively Zande. And they got married and had him. He learned both languages. So he was trying to see if his native languages were related to the ancient Egyptian. And when once he established that, he expanded it to other languages uh, including some of the languages which were discussed in terms of Obinga and Diop's work. And this is how he verified Negro Egyptian. So he kept the label of Negro Egyptian in his 2010 text. So that's where we, uh, we find ourselves now. So his original model, so it's different than what you find in Theophilo Obinga's work. So let's go back to Theophilo Binga. So this is Theophilo Binga's Negro Egyptian, um, which includes Nilo Saharan, Niger Kordofanian, and then the leftover languages of Afro-Asiatic. But when we go to Jean-Claude Mboli's work, um, it's a totally different thing. So remember that he did his from scratch. So what he broke his into Negro, uh, archaic Negro Egyptian, and then archaic Negro Egyptian breaks up into three branches. Branches he calls Kweki, Kikwe, and Kikuki. <laughs> and then what he argues here is that the Kweki and Kikuki branch, these branch one here, branch two, branch three over here, the branch one and branch two, lived amongst each other for a very long time. And because they have been interacting in the same geographical space throughout history, these two different branches begin to converge on each other. And so all of the languages which made up these, these two branches converged on one another and they started to share vocabulary and grammatical features. So they began to look like and sound like, you know, a common language. And so that's what, what we mean by convergence. So this establishes basically another language family and which he calls post-classic Negro Egyptian. So we have archaic, and then this stage here is the classic stage. So archaic, classic and then post-classic so after the classic stage and then after this classic stage 
um, it branches off into two different dialects or two different language types, which he calls Bere and Beher. And so in the Bere branch, you have languages like Hausa, Zande, Middle Egyptian. And then you have the, in terms of the dialect of Beher, is Coptic, Songo, and Somali. And so this third branch here, he hypothesized, um, is the origin of the Semitic languages. And so the differences of these languages here are based on how the words are formed in these different branches in dialects. And so this is going to be very critical to understand. And I will try my best to explain this as simply as possible. So, you know, this is going to be a little bit technical, and this, this is going to be, you know, uh, linguistic heavy here. So <laughs> those two branches or, or dialects of, of Bere and Beher migrated in different paths. So on the left here, you see this map of the Bere branch. And so the Bantu being a part of the Bere branch he argues originates in East Africa and these folks migrate, you know, from the Great Lakes region into these different parts of Central and Southern Africa. And then, you know, out of that proto-Bantu branch of the Bere, you know, comes Middle Egyptian, Zande, Hassa, and Bambara. But they coalesce over here in the Sudan and then spread out from the Sudan in these different directions. The Beher languages, you know, these are your Wolof, Nuer, the Luo languages. Then Songo into the, you know, Central African Republic, Somali language, Coptic, and Zerma. Zerma is a, a Songhai language, a Songhai language. And so these are two different branches of Negro Egypt or post-classic Negro Egyptian. <laughs> so, China into. So, remember that this is the label that I have given to Negro Egyptian. So, you know, if you read my latest works that came out in 2020, you will see China into instead of Negro Egyptian. I've already done a a, a series of talks on that and then everything is explained in the books but um and so i just wanted to make that known when i show this updated uh representation of the the branches so i will not use china into throughout this conversation but i just wanted to put that into perspective for this particular slide and so I'm, I'm going to keep everything Negro Egyptian so we don't get confused because we're talking about Mboli's work 2010. So this, this variation that you see here is from his upcoming book. And so this is me translating this into English and then doing my own renaming. But this is all of his structure. Hold on. <clears throat> so... I renamed the entire language family Chianconda. And his Mboli's Negro Egyptian archaic or archaic Negro Egyptian is for me Chianconda Chikulu or, or archaic Chianconda. The classical stage here is classical Chianconda. And then Chiana into is this branch here. And so <laughs> let me kind of break this down a little bit here. So actually I will wait to the other slides. But what what this is just an updated version. So Chin into or the Negro Egyptian post classic or post classic Negro Egyptian uh, you know breaks up into these branches but he's showing here the interrelationship 
that these languages have. So beforehand in this 2010 work, this Kikuki branch is uh, doesn't interact much with the post-classic Negro Egyptian. But what he's arguing now in his updated work is that the Kikuki group has been interacting. So he has more evidence that that is the fact. So that's why you see this arrow now pointing to this chin into which represents post-classic Negro Egyptian. And so it is this Kikuki group that becomes the branch Kabed. And Kabed is an Arabic word for liver. And it's the interaction between the Kabed language or languages and the interaction of the Bihar dialect that creates pre-proto-Semitic. And when the pre-proto-Semitic speakers interact with the proto-Bantu speakers from the Bere branch, that's what creates proto-Semitic. And so this is a, a totally different conversation, but it is a relevant one and just wanted to state that um, before we move on. <laughs> so that what Mboli argues is that Negro Egyptian is built from 10 onomatopoeic roots. And if you know about onomatopoeia, these are words that are representative of the sound that an object or a phenomenon makes. So if I'm playing basketball and I shoot a three from, you know, from half court or whatnot, and I hit nothing but net, you'll hear me make the sound swoosh. Swoosh is, the, is a word, but it represents the sound of the net, the ball going through the net, you know, without hitting the rim or the backboard or whatnot. So it's simply swish, as we say on the court. So uh, when you say cuckoo, you know, these are onomatopoeic words. So what he's saying is that, you know, based on his analysis, there were 10 onomatopoeic roots that gave birth to the vocabulary in Negro Egyptian. So they are K or K, sound of dry wood being cut, or the sound of crackling a dry branch. Hu, the action of blowing or breath. Chui sound of the mouth chewing or trying to chew so it's like sweet something to that nature and then you had this kind of nasalized who the action of smell uh, or sniffing so it's more of an in sucking more than the exhaling in the, in the sense and then you have sku the sound emitted from the throat <laughs> that's where your you know your glotto is then you have nge or nge, the baby sound identified as a call to his mother. Then kui, a cry of shivering or to trill. So you have and then you have these vowels. And so these vowels have a grammatical function. So the e, indication of remoteness or there. Then you have u, indication of proximity or here. And then you have a, indication of, of size or big. Or, uh, or grand, you know, uh, indication of far away exactly. And so this is at the archaic stage. This is, you know, this is roughly around the time when humans started speaking. And uh, in Africa, or at least this branch of, of individuals, you know, their their words were these onomatopoeia. So keep this in mind. So notice that these are monosyllabic consonant vowel uh, setups for the most part uh, here. So then the second stage, now we're in the classic stage. So we are hunter gatherers <laughs> that, uh, and these hunter gatherers begin to combine these, these, archaic words to make more complex words and so you get words like tree meaning game 
So what is tri again? Um, <clears throat> that is the sound of the mouth chewing. So this is in relationship. They saw this in relationship to food. So game. So the word for food is the word for to chew. And I see uh, Brother Echo uh, saying that a lot of those onomatopoeic roots still exist in the airway language. And it is very striking, he says. <laughs> and so we have hoo-hoo, lung, or meat. So you have this from this expression of breathing, then becomes the word for lung, and then meat. And then you have kehu, the word for fire. So this ke is the word for the sound of a dry stick. It becomes the word for stick. And this word who meaning to, to blow. Now you have the word for fire or sun. So when you are out in the bush and you want to start a fire, you rub two sticks together and you blow on it. And that's how the word for fire comes about. So there's a logic to the combining of these roots. And so you have kiku, javelin, Lance, Kiku, chief or leader. And this is a word that becomes um, for mountain. Uh, Kiku, rainy season. As you can see, these are like homonyms, but different uh, variations on the homonyms. And then Kehu, dry season, uh, which is related to this word for fire and sun. So these are just a few words that are being built, um, you know, from these archaic. So the archaic stage, you saw the tent onomatopoeia. Then in this, the classic stage, you are seeing now the combination of these monosyllabic roots. And so, you know, you get a glimpse here. This is from our, our good brother, Jean-Claude Mboli, one of his slides that he did. Um, and he's showing you here, you know, how these archaic roots become the, the first true words in the Negro Egyptian language family. And so, you know, uh, this ki and then ki ku ki for body and then ku for trunk, you know, or base for foot and things of that nature. And so he's showing that, you know, the word for stick, you know, uh, then becomes the word for an object or a tool or thing or the uh, the the adjective hard and then force and then hurt and dangerous and stone there's a a logic that is evolving here and so you know this is going to be critical uh you know for understanding this argument so what he says here is that the words of the very first stage of the african mother tongue negro egyptian is composed of two switchable consonant vowel syllables Syllables such as ta, ki, po, fa, etc. So you have consonant vowel, consonant vowel. And so these these actually read like small sentences. You know, almost like if I was to say the word blackbird. You know. Um, and then you have here, you know, so what he's, what he's showing here is that there was a stress on one of the syllables. And so... Right here, it's in red, the first syllable being stressed. And then, um, so you have this variety where the stressed first syllable and then the unstressed second syllable. Or the unstressed first syllable and stressed second syllable. So there was a free word order form in the early stages of Negro Egyptian. And so, you know, only over time did these forms start to coalesce, you know, in a in a rule based, you know, process. So what he says is that each consonant vowel syllables is called a primal lexeme. Of course, the 10 such primal lexemes have been isolated in Negro Egyptian, all are onomatopoeia. So in association, the more significant word, the stressed word, the determined, is accented. Uh, high tone, whereas the less significant determinant is not, regardless of the order. So high tone, neutral, or low tone, high tone, neutral, I mean, low tone, neutral, uh, high tone here. So the stress 
is is either on the first syllable or the second syllable depending on the word <laughs> so for those who don't know like the different types of you know syllables that you can have so i i, I gave some english examples so a consonant vowel word in english is the word go a vowel consonant variation is the word at a consonant vowel consonant situation is the word sit and then a consonant vowel vowel consonant word is fool um i should have put an example here for consonant vowel consonant vowel which would be like a word bore like to bore b-o-r b-o-r-e um and so these these are just the different types of uh word formations that you can see in english and so the let's go back here just a moment so remember that the in the classic stage there are three groups kikwe kweki and kikuki so these words are just you know uh ki and ku uh that you know have evolved in a certain manner or have been grouped in a certain manner and so they all originally were kikuki but because of the way that the stress was on the word order the what is consonant vowel consonant vowel consonant vowel here one of the the either the prefix or suffix merged at the end in the unstressed syllable and so that's how we get from kikuki to kikwe and kikuki to kweki but in this branch none of the syllables are stressed so that's why they've been able to keep this tri-radical formulation that you see in Semitic in the Kabed branch. So right now we're just going to focus on the Kikwe group and the Kweki group. So let me go back to uh, this slide here. So you see evidence of this in these various languages. So in Bantu language, the Ingala or Lingala, as we would say, you would see this word here, kuni, which means rich or kony, firewood. But then you would see another variation in the same language, kama, which means a hundred. And so these belong to two different branches. So remember what I said up here. Let me go back. That these were three separate branches. But because branch one and branch two have been interacting with each other for a long period of time, they began to merge on one another. And they were borrowing vocabulary for uh, the same words, but in a different context. And so when they coalesced and became post classic Negro Egyptian, each language had words from both groups, from Kikwe and Kweki. And so the what you'll notice about these groups is that the consonant vowel, consonant vowel from the Kweki group is switched into this group. So notice the word Kikwe. When you notice Kweki, it is the word Kikwe backwards. So the Kwe syllable in Kikwe is now the first syllable in Kweki. So I hope this is making sense for, for those of you who are listening. So these two separate branches, as you can see the arrows here interacting with each other to become these, their interaction becomes Negro, uh, post-classic Negro Egyptian or what I call Chiena into. And so you see this evidence in in the languages. So, for example, the word kin, to be complete, kin, fire, from the Kweki branch. In the Kikwe branch, you have this word kim, complete, kim, black. 
And then you have Nsongo, Kono, Be Big, and then Quay, Complete, Kwa, Hair, etc. These are just different variations um, from this, this coalescence uh, of, of Kikwe here. Well, let me find one that is that is more because there's in Songo, there's some other stuff that is going on here, which you know will take some time to explain. But in Ingala, this this will make more sense. So notice that this word pasa, meaning twin, and this word sobya, sobya, ceremonial knife. The root pasa is in this is found in this Egyptian word here, pesesh, and this sh part is actually a suffix, a verbal suffix, meaning to divide. And then you have this word sef, to cut, and then with the T suffix, it becomes the word for sword. And so this twin, this word for twin, pasa, comes from this notion of to divide. So if I was to take a cake and divide it in half, you would have two symmetrical sides. So the, the notion in the archaic Negro Egyptian is that, or the classical Negro Egyptian is that my twin is, you know, my mirror, my symmetric mirror, my other half. So from so this word twin is a derived root from the same root here that means to divide. And so from that same, just as we see here in Egyptian, pesesh, the root here is pis or pas or pasa or something like that. And here we see that the syllables have switched. So the S in pes, in pasa here, is, is now the first consonant, and the P sound became F. So hopefully you can see exactly what I'm see, saying here. The syllables are switched, but they're all, both in the same language. Hold on. They're both in the same language. So it's the same thing in the Zande language. It's where para, to divide, and then sapa, cut, sape, knife. So you see the same pattern here. It's just the same word. So this, this word para, meaning to divide, is this word sapa in reverse. And so you should know that this KP is a simultaneous articulation. Pa. And, and and probably another dialect is just pa. And so you we had the same thing in Yoruba. So the Yoruba they'll say pa. We don't have this sound in English, but you know, and oftentimes you'll just see it spelled with a P. So these are the same uh sounds basically. These are uh 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 phonetic uh in, in terms of you know the, the language of Zande. But this, you notice there's an R here in this second consonant, but there's an S here in the reverse. And you should know that R can become S, especially intervocally. So this S becomes R over here because the R, this S was in between two vowels. So that's just a kind of a linguistic uh, thing that we have to, you know, uh, keep in mind here. And so um, we see the same thing here in Somali, bar, half, and then soft, cut, seaf, sword. Notice it's the same syllable switched. And so the kweki and kikwe was the vocabulary that originally were in separate branches. They were all borrowed by these languages and now they just become the you know part of the lexicon of the languages that emerge from post classic negro egyptian so now when the post classic negro egyptian splits into two all the languages that are in the bere branch and the beher branch or dialect they have they they all have words from both the kweki and Kweki, the Kikwe and Kweki branches. So I hope this makes sense. That you know, just because you find in the, for example, the Bantu or Egyptian language words that belong to the Kweki and Kikwe 
branches from the earlier stage that these constitute evidence of separate languages. No, all the languages that originate from the post-classic stage, which is right here, they inherited the vocabulary from both these separate branches that, that were once separate branches in the remote past. And so now they become, um, you know, again, as I just stated, part of the, the, the basic vocabulary of the Bere dialect and the Beher dialect. So I hope I'm making sense. Uh, <laughs> let me, so, you know, again, I'll just pause this here. You can pause this when you come back and review so that you can see, you know, and, and notice, you'll notice, you know, the, the, the truth in this, this breakup here that in, in Boley, uh discovered. And so this is something that I discovered as well independently of Mboli, but I didn't do the extensive work that he did. I just noticed that you would find the same word just with the syllable switched in the Egyptian language. And this let me know, you know, my argument that there were other languages being spoken because of this. But, you know, I have a more mature uh, perspective on this, this now. So here's a, another example of in Egyptian itself, Kikwe and Kweki. So, you know, you have this word, Rebi. Actually, this is where the English word love comes from. Um, to love, to desire, wish, to long for, to covet. And then you have the syllabic inverse, Mer, to wish, to love, to covet, desire. And so I, I show the correspondence here. Rebet, Rebata, Kao. Marit, black cow. Reb, chisel. Mer, chisel. Ru, ruwa, death, or to be dead. Merhe, to decay, to pass away. Rebiet, servant. Meru, servants, underlings. Rebu, clothes, garments. Meru, strips of cloth, bundle, etc., etc. So, you when we're doing the internal analysis, we can see that the Egyptian has inherited from the classical stage vocabulary from the Kikwe and Kweki dialects. And this is how you would demonstrate that uh, in the text. So now here's a different argument that I make here. So hold on one sec as I take a sip of my Arizona tea. And I hope y'all are still rocking with me and that, you know, what I'm saying is making sense. Again, you will have an opportunity once this is done to to go back and and review this stuff. So uh and then, of course, some of this stuff will be repeated in the the books. So if you haven't purchased the books, uh, I would encourage you to do so. Illusion Volume 2 and Towards a Comparative Dictionary of Chikam and Modern African Languages by your brother, Sarim Hotep. So now what I show here is that both of these varieties of words here are both from the Kekwi branch. And so this, what we usually say is in terms of shin, uh, actually is an evolution of the word kim in Egyptian. But what I show here is that these are the same words or have the same roots, but they're pronounced totally different. This informs me because there's no evidence of a logical evolution in Egyptian itself, because both of these are being spoken at the same time. All of these words are being used at the same time in the Old Kingdom. So what this tells me is that one of these comes from a different related language, that one of these are borrowings into Egyptian. <coughs> So 
so uh, so we have Shin to block, and then we have Inebet, lock or fortress. Shini to be round, to surround, to encircle. Inebet, a fence. And so notice the prefixes and suffixes that give derived meanings to these roots. Shini, a vessel. Nebet, a vessel. Shini, a tree or its fruits. Seneb, a fruit tree and its fruit. Shinu, a rope. Seneb, cord, twine. Shini, a workman. Neb, a creator or a builder. You know, this, this lets me know that one of these are not part of the old kingdom, middle, middle uh, Egyptian direct lineage that one of these are borrowings into the language and so we'll have to do some more work uh some more detail work to see how this has happened but these are the same these both come from kikwe uh and have um you know evolved on different lines and so uh one of these are borrowing so we 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 can tell this you know by doing the work so now we're getting into more detail of the post-classic Negro Egyptian. So I'm trying to build you up so we can answer the question about Coptic being a separate. What is the evidence for Coptic being a separate language? And so now we get into post-classic Negro Egyptian. So in Boli on page 440, and I'm translating this from the French, he says, indeed, non-labialized, so the non-labialized syllable K for the queki, and so a labial is the sound uh, M, B as in boy, and wah, 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 the W. So these are the sounds that you make by closing or approximating both lips to each other. So those are labials. That's where labial lips come from. So when he says, indeed, the non-labialized syllable out of kikwe or kweki, uh, which is k for kweki or group, and the k for the kikwe group, from the proto-words, the primal lexemes, which we mentioned earlier, have helped to rebuild these two dialects, which have originated, as we have shown above, from a primal lexeme in the determinate position. These two groups have merely reduced the new trisyllabic words into disyllabic words. So remember that the consonant vowel became consonant vowel, consonant vowel in the classic stage. So this is what he's talking about here. These two groups have merely reduced the new trisyllabic words into disyllabic words in terms of remember that the kiku ki, the trisyllabic form in the kikwe and kweki groups have reduced from that kikuki form. So that's what he's saying here. This has led to the emergence of complex consonants like zande labio velars or hasaglottos. Having lost its contrastive function, the accent eventually disappeared in an area of each of the two kikwe and kweki groups, respectively, after which created the subgroups kwe and kwe respectively. So the kwe in kweki and then the kwe in kikwe. So the unaccented of these forms drop. So that's the k in this in this uh, in this group uh, respectively. And there are many dialectical branches due to different realizations of the prefix of agent and of the closed central vowel. All of these varieties of Negro Egyptian derive from two groups discussed above, that's the Kikwe and Kweki, and will greatly come into contact with each other over a long period of time, sharing many elements of their grammars and their vocabularies, and finally getting close enough to be considered a single language. And so that's what post-classic Negro Egyptian is. So different languages, living language population or language speakers living in close proximity of each other living for a long period of time as a result of intermarriage and communicating in terms of trade maybe wars and 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 trying to communicate with one another the languages started to sound alike where you know these different languages now really seem to be dialects of a singular language 
and they they come together that you can consider them a single language and so that language stage is what he calls post-classic negro egyptian which we mentioned earlier so remember that i renamed negro egyptian or at least post-classic negro egyptian shina into so this is my uh graphic here to kind of you know make it a little bit more simple in terms of understanding exactly uh what is going on here so <laughs> we have the post-classic stage and notice that you know we have the stress in the first syllable part here and we have this is a distinguished factor uh, in terms of what we call a isogloss and so for example if we take the word you know aka or ata notice that there is a vowel in front of the k and a vowel after the k there's a vowel in front of the t and a vowel after the t so the post classic stage the words were in this formation and so this is what we call the better branch b-e-r-e -E. it has this these words have this form but then you know another branch develops which is we call the beher branch and so notice that there's you know uh no stress here and the now we have a vowel vowel consonant or vowel vowel a a k a a t this is what distinguishes the branches here so we see here that in the berry branch, a word ends in a vowel. But in the beher branch, the word ends, the root ends in a consonant. And that is the consonant is doubled in um, before the final consonant. So these are two distinguishing factors here. And there's a reason why this, these different word formations are the way they are. So from the post-classic, we have pre-proto-bantu. It is pre-proto-bantu that gives rise ultimately to Middle Egyptian, Hasa, Zande, Mande, and Sumerian. Um, and then pre-proto-bantu gives birth to proto-bantu, which gives birth to Gabaya and just the Bantu languages in general. Gabaya is a Bantu language um, in general. So um, I have to actually update this, but uh, and so, but in the Beher branch, you have the newer, you know, and Luo and um, you know, collagen, you know, and Wolof in this one area. Then you have Coptic, Songo, Somali, Zerma, and Banda in this family, or uh, or whatnot that that forms a a subgroup of the Beher. So you know, take some time when you have time. Again, it is in my Aluja volume two and you you know you can you know if you don't have the text you can always come back to this point in the video and really kind of study this but again pay attention to the word formation of the Bere branch and the Behir branch and so here are the known languages that belong to these two different branches of post-classic Negro Egyptian they're the Bere and you know, notice that the word berry again, B E R E, consonant vowel, consonant vowel. And then the word beher, these are both the same word, which means liver in, in two different languages. And the Mboli uses these words to really kind of stress the difference in the pronunciation of these inherited words. So for the beher, we have. B E E R, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. So keep this in mind. So for Mboli, Zande, Middle Egyptian, Hasa, Bantu, Gabaya, Bambara, Heban, and I include Sumerian, belong to the Beri branch. The Beher branch is the Somali language, Songo in the Central Republic of Africa. Coptic, Wolof, Nur, Banda, Luo, Songoi, uh, and it is represented by Zerma in Mboli's 2010 text. So Zerma is a Songoi language, a Songhai language. 
Then you have Fulani and uh, Sada. So, as stated earlier, the, iso the isoglossal separating these two branches being defined by the presence or absence of the accent on the suffixes appeared at the post-classical stage. So there are different suffixes, the masculine suffix, the feminine suffix, the plural suffix, etc. We observe different syllable structures. So I don't know if y'all can see this. So let's look at this first bullet point here. So in the bere branch, you have a word that, you know, has a, a, a stress or accent on the first syllable and the last syllable in terms of the suffix um, or, or, or whatnot. Uh, and so you had this represented here, consonant, vowel, I mean, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. So there's a, a stress on this, on this last syllable. And you have consonant vowel, consonant vowel structure. But in the behead branch, the in terms of the final, there is no stress or no accent. And so you have consonant vowel consonant, but then it turns into consonant vowel vowel consonant. That's what you see here. So as I stated earlier, the word for liver in the Zande and the Somali language is used as a representative of the two different dialects of post-classic Negro Egyptian. So <laughs> the word for liver is, how should I say? The word for liver, for heart, for lungs, in many, in many cases, and the word for belly are all the same word in, in, in Negro Egyptian. And because those are the internal organs, the vital internal aspects of oneself. And so that's how the, you know, these words came to represent these, uh, all of these different things in various different languages. So the word in the Hassa language for liver is actually hanta. However, the word for desire is beji or bj. And this, what I want to stress here is that this is the actual cognate to the word bere and behead. And, and so this is, you know, they hold on to an, an a, a more conservative version of the word before you know, the, the K sound, and this, in this case, it is voice became R. But remember that what I said, that the same word for liver is also the same word for heart. And then the same word for heart becomes other words like spirit and soul. And we'll get into an example of that later. But this is the cognate for it. But notice what I want you to notice about the Bere branch. Notice that all of the words for liver end in a vowel in the bere branch. So hasa, hanta, and zande, bere, and it's a word for liver, but it also means heart, as I said earlier. In Middle Egyptian, this is the bara, the spirit or soul. The word for spirit and soul derives or one word for spirit and soul in Negro Egyptian languages derives from the word for heart or liver because the spirit of soul is the essential part of a person. So the, the words for the essential part of man becomes a, a metaphorically expanded to this concept of spirit. And so that's how you get the word for spirit deriving from the word for breath. Because remember, the word for heart the word for liver, the word for lungs, and the word for belly all are the same word in uh, classical Negro Egyptian languages. So in Proto-Bantu, body, the word for liver, again, also the heart. Sumerian, bara, bala, word for, um, for liver. And then in the Sango language, it is be, 
which is uh and actually this may be in the wrong uh section because songo belongs to the Behir branch so this actually belongs over here but there's even though this ends in a vowel it it how should i say you see this low tone here that means it lost the syllable and so uh and so this uh, actually should be um you know scratch from here but you see it over here in shango so it's bad it comes from this variant here so but notice here in coptic that we have bai for the word for soul and spirit in middle egyptian and it comes from bai notice the diphthong and we'll get into what a diphthong is but it's two vowels in between two consonants and the R sound here, the nasalized of Vular Trio, disappeared, and we're only left with the diphthong in Coptic. Notice in Somali, Behir, or Bir, again, a word for liver, Sango, Be, Collagen, Koi, notice a long vowel here. In the New Orleans language, Biel, uh, color. Even though this is the word for color, there's a discussion which demonstrates that the word for heart becomes the word for red in color. And, and so the, the general word for red then became just a general word for color in the new era language. But this is the cognate for it, even though it no longer holds the meaning of liver or heart. And then we have in, in Wolof, the word for liver in Wolof, however, is the word rest. But the word for belly or inside is bed. And so remember what I said, the word for belly, the word for heart, the word for lungs, um, and the word for, uh, what am I missing? Uh, heart, lungs, belly, and liver, you know, were the words for, they're all the same word. And uh many of the negro egyptian languages so one one language may may associate it with the belly another language may associate it with the heart and the liver and another language may associate it with the lungs um but they all derive from the same uh word and process so pay attention here bere words end in vowels beher words end in consonants and so here's just an example of what I meant earlier. So there's a word moyo or mooyo, uh, where we get keep moyo from in terms of religion, but that it's a word that literally means heart, but the derived meanings are life, spirit, soul, will, desire, design, inclination, feeling, mood, thought, and is even used as a greeting. You know, hello, hi. Uh, or would not. So when we go back here and we see the word in Hasa, Beje, desire, or we see in Middle Egyptian, Bada, soul or spirit, this is within the same semantic range that we find in, in other African languages. So, <laughs> so now we'll go a little bit deeper into the characteristics of the Bere and Beher languages. I appreciate y'all for still rocking with me. So, as I stated earlier, the isoglosses that distinguish the Beher from the Bede branches is that the Beher branches, their words are typically final consonants. They have final consonants. And they also have long vowels or diphthongs in the middle position. So, if you look at the very word Beher, it is it is spelt like beer in in English, but um, it is different than the word bere because bere is consonant vowel consonant vowel, whereas beher is consonant vowel vowel consonant. So I'm gonna keep drilling this in y'all head this whole conversation. So 
you know, the English language is like a Beher language. And you notice that most of the words in English end in consonants. And, you know, so like we have this word pill, you know, it ends in two consonants. So you had a short vowel, you know, with the double consonant endings here, like nil or ring. But notice this word feel or veal or zeal or seal, reef. Uh, beat, bait, boot, boat. You notice this one, you know, anomaly here, bore, but we don't even pronounce it as bore. We pronounce it as bore. We pronounce it as if the, the vowel doesn't exist at the end of the word. Because in English, you know, unlike French, we like to end our words in consonants. And so you see that in these examples. And so you notice that in English, we have the consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant structure of the words for the most part. And then, of course, we have with the short vowels, but you, you can see that a lot of these shorts are um, the, the last consonant is redoubled or doubled, I should say. Um, sofa is one of the rare words where it ends in A. But I think sofa is actually a borrowed word into English. And so somebody go to, what is that? Um, etymonline.com and see if that is the case uh, for me and, and go into the chat. But I, I think that the word sofa is a borrowing into, into English. So, um, matter of fact, I can just look this up on he says raise turkish yep it's from turkish sofa from arabic sufa bench or stone so that's how you can tell you know often if there's a borrowing or not you know the word sofa is 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 from arabic um and through turkish And so that's not a native word, but you notice most of the native words end in a consonant in English. Let me check this word bore real quick and see if that's the same. Uh, old English borean to bore through, perforate from bore auger from Proto Germanic boron. No, that's a native word. Um, and so. It says boron, source also of Old Norse bora, Swedish bora, uh, Old German boron, boreen, Middle Dutch. This may be, well, I can see why. I can see how we became, yeah, and we'll get into, this would have been a good example too. I'll say that for another discussion. I'm kind of talking to myself right now. But yeah, the word bore here demonstrates something that we'll get into in a second. And so, you know, if you're not familiar with what a diphthong is, remember that the Beher branch, they have a lot of diphthongs and long vowels in between two consonants. And, you know, in English, we have diphthongs. So when you say the word day or bake, notice that you would use the, the Latin alphabet A for bake but if we were to really pronounce it or we were to spell it the way it was actually pronounced, you would spell it B-E-I-K-E -E because you pronounce it, you know, A. -E. And so bake, page, date, name. Notice you don't say date, name, laze. We don't speak like that. It's a lot. It's a little bit longer. We say bake, page date name lazy and so boy noise point oil size fine you don't say fine you say fine sky try tie eyes you know so notice that the way you spell it doesn't necessarily correlate with how it is actually pronounced. <clears throat> so, 
So cow, brow, how, wow, mouse, go, toe, though, no, low, float. You know, it, it'll take a while to notice the the diphthongs and how to recognize them because a lot of times when we say words, we identify them by the way they're spelled uh, in the written form. But, you know, linguists have a different way of, of spelling words and identifying the actual phones in the language. And so just, you know, this is just to give you an idea of, <laughs> hold on one sec. Uh, okay, adjusted my headphones here. Um, just to give you an idea of the, how the diphthongs are. So notice again. So now we're going to look at, hopefully this is a little bit more clear. So let's look at the word again. Zande, bere, liver. Middle Egyptian, bara, heart, soul. Beher, Somali, liver. Now the, the Coptic word, for liver is actually meuse or meuse or mausi, an internal organ of liver. Um, it's found in Middle Egyptian as mizet, liver. And so notice that between the two consonants, you had this quote unquote semi vowel in the middle and then suffix with T which, which uh, this grammatical form doesn't exist in Coptic, you know? And so we see the diphthong. Uh, I should have kind of spelled a lot of these out um, for you, but this, this is an O and U sound put together. So this is M-A-O-U. And sometimes, depending on context, this will represent the W sound or like a oi or, you know, uh, oi sound like, you know, OU, a uh, diphthong. So you know, we had the word bere, forest. And then, um, you know, we could say bere, bereta or bula. He says bulata, uh, bush. And then Somali, beher, garden. And but in Coptic, you have bu. And so it's a long, this ooh, this is a long ooh sound, bush. You have pata, egg, and then you have perut, uh, fruit, and then bead, egg. And then the the word for grain here is uh, fray. Um, but the real word for egg is, again, another, this is C, this is S-O-O-U-H-E. So it's like soye, soye, you know. But again, diphthong, diphthong. I mean, long vowel here, diphthong here. Lingala, boko arm, and there's a reason for why the word for fruit and the egg, and um, and Boley discusses that in his text. So we don't have time to go through the semantic evolution of this form here in egg. But in lingala, boko arm, and then. Uh, this is actually switched here. Uh, Geber, Gubula, arm. And then Nuar, Wuok, arm. And then notice here, Chiboi, arm. Uh, or Guboi. Again, it ends in a, a diphthong. And so notice that this sound here, the, the nasalized Uvular trio, which is in the GB, this is an R type sound, this doesn't exist in, in Coptic. And so, matter of fact, it was lost in most Bihar languages, which is a distinguishing factor between uh, the two languages. So, Hasa, Gasi, opposite side. So, notice consonant vowel, consonant vowel. In uh, Egyptian, it is Gaso, side. And then Somali, Gis, side. And then uh, Chos, side in uh, Egyptian excuse me, in Coptic. And and so, but this only has a single uh, vowel, but notice that it ends in a consonant. And so when you see, for example, a word in Coptic that ends in a vowel or a diphthong, a consonant was lost in the process. 
And so, Huru, Sun, Day, in the Zande language. Heru, or Hariru, Day, in Middle Egyptian. And then you have Her, Heat, um, in Somali, because it comes from a word um, dealing with fire and sun and heat. Uh, so this is a derived form. But notice here in Coptic, Hoi, Day, again, ending in a diphthong, because there is no R sound here. And so you can see that the structure of Coptic, for example, and Somali, for the same words in Coptic and Somali and Zande, the pronunciations are consistent in each language, but they are different. And Coptic falls in line with Somali and Nuer because they're all Bere languages. But Middle Egyptian, remember, they didn't write their vowels in Middle Egyptian. So how do we know that this is pronounced in these ways? We'll get to that in a second. And so, <laughs> for example, we know that Egyptian, you know, is... Uh, and I'll give a, an example here with habesu in a second, but habesu is a word for, you know, garment. And then habus, garment in, in Coptic. But notice this long O here. The word iteru, river. But we have a Coptic form in Middle Egyptian. So remember, that the Coptic language was spoken at the same time as Middle Egyptian. And the lower class, you know, spoke the Coptic language. But remember that just because the vast majority of the people are the lower class, the indigenous folks, just like African Americans here in the United States, the lower there are people in the lower caste who rise in the ranks. So part of the indigenous people become scribes and administrators. And so when they're writing, oftentimes they'll pronounce words in the way that they pronounce it in, in, in their native Coptic language. And sometimes in the old kingdom and middle kingdom, you'll see that they'll spell it in the way that they pronounce it. So the word Iteru, the same root for river, in the Coptic language, they inherited the same word, but they pronounce it your because the T intervocalic T weakens and drops. So you're just left with the, the I or Y and the W represents the O or O or sound. So you have your, so you have the diphthong here at the beginning, uh, which really just becomes the Y and then or the river. And so notice that the word Heru, Horus, becomes Hor in Coptic. And so <laughs> this is very critical in understanding these things. So in the Akkadian script, they pronounce Horus as Huru. Notice, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. But the Coptic language, they spell it consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. Or they pronounce it consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. It's spelled here with a, a consonant, vowel, consonant. But notice that it ends in a consonant and the vowel is a long vowel. These are two totally different pronunciations. Because they there's two uh, different, um, again, two different pronunciations because they're two different languages. So the, the Egyptians didn't spell it, you know, uh, hor is a long O like this. And so Akkadian, again, gives us an idea that there's two separate languages. So this word here, wepu tiau, messengers, in the Akkadian language is pronounced uputi. So you have a vowel, then consonant vowel, consonant vowel. 
ends in a ends in a vowel. But they also pronounce it uput. Long, just how we saw. Notice that this W in here becomes this long U or O, and then it ends in a consonant. And so they have two different ways because they were they were speaking to two different peoples. Or, you know, or the Egyptians who were writing in the Akkadian pronounce it in two different ways. So I hope you are seeing these differences here because this is important. And so uh, these are just more examples of, you know, for example, if we look at Wolof and Zande, Wolof again is a Beher language and Zande is a Bere language. And so for the word for house, Kur, in Wolof is Kira, house. Different pronunciations. The word for neck, bat, or bat. And then zande, goro. Consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. But consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. And so let's look at Coptic here. This is the word per, as in, you know, uh, you know, per ah, you know, uh, great, you know, the, the word for Pharaoh, which is a great house. And so we we have here per and poor, but we also have pay, a diphthong. This word for neck, mote, neck, but moot, neck, throat, back, diphthong. Wolof, ear, belly, inside, intestine. And then Zande, Vuru, belly. But in Coptic, we have, it's a different word, but it's still a diphthong. But notice that it ends in vowels here. But that's because of another process. These are representative of changed suffixes, consonants, that became vowels. But the root is still this over here, what you see here. So you will see it's the same thing. The, the dominant Coptic is dominated by diphthongs or long vowels. And they end primarily in consonants. Whereas the, it's the same thing here for Wolof, but it's different in Zande and Middle Egyptian and Hassa, for example. So, but there are times where you can see that the Beher languages will end in a vowel. But you can tell that this is a new evolutionary process that is the result of interactions with Bere languages. So let's look at these words in the Zerma language, which is a Songhai language, a Songhai language, and the Zande language in the Central African Republic. So we had this word, Kuru, skin. Then we have Zande, Kpoto, skin. Beeri, big. Word, to be big. This is actually, I think, should be Egyptian. Beori, good, beautiful. Mberi, good, sweet. Notice that where well, you can say, well, they end in vowels. Shouldn't they be a better language? No. Again, this is a new evolutionary process. What gives it away in terms of Zerma is these long vowels here in the center. So this informs us that this is not a, a Beri branch. This is a Behir branch where Zande stays true to form. So this word Tooru, this is where the root, this is the root to the word nature. So it has it in the Zerma language, it's the idol. And Zande is Toro, ghost. And the Akan language is Intoro, or Toro. And so you gotta, gotta know these things. And I'm, I'm gonna keep reemphasizing these things so that y'all, when y'all are reading these texts, y'all can catch it. And so again, one of the reasons why the Egyptologists and the linguists dealing with Egyptian have missed all of this is because they've been using the Greenberg mass comparative method. 
And it's only when you do the historical comparative method that you can discover these things because they're, they're being lazy. They weren't being detailed. And when you're doing this kind of work, you have to be very detailed and critical. And so it seems mundane. It seems like it's boring. It doesn't mean much, but it means a lot, especially when we're talking about the history of African people. And so, again, this is just another example of Coptic and the long, you know, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant structure uh, <laughs> in, in the particular language. So here are some of the characteristics that make Coptic a separate language. You know, just a few arguments. So we already seen that, you know, one of the primary ways to tell a Berry branch language versus a Beher branch language in the Negro Egyptian modality is in the Bere branch, it is consonant vowel, consonant vowel primarily for its words in terms of the word shape and structure. But in the Beher branch, it is consonant vowel, vowel, consonant. And those two vowels can either be a diphthong or a long vowel. And the words end primarily in consonants. And so, you know, according to Mboli, one of the ways that you can distinguish between the two branches is the homorganic vowel E, which is prefix that was inherited into Bantu as part of its class prefix and kept in Middle Egyptian, but is not present in any of the Beher branches, including Coptic. And so this is an isogloss that separates the two. So Coptic does not have this E homorganic uh, vowel prefix, which is also a class. And so this is why you, you know, um, there, there is no Iman or Imun like this in, in Coptic uh, or, or native. So this is, you know, the word, uh, the god Amen in Egyptian has this particular prefix and it is present in the Bantu variant of it as Imani. <laughs> and so this is a linguistic factor and I should give some more examples, you know, of this in the other languages. But as I stated before, uh, another characteristic is that Coptic has also lost track of the nasalized uvular trio which is this symbol here, which is transliterated like this in the writing, in modern writing. After vowel lengthening or a diphthongization of the preceding vowel. For example, Middle Egyptian, bara, soul, spirit. Coptic, bai, soul. Fulani, ingbilu. So remember, Fulani is a Beher language. It ends in a vowel here, but this is... Uh, because of some other processes, but it betrays itself by this long e or e belu. And then Angashua El Kikongo Bindo. You know, these are just different cognates for the word bara soul in the Egyptian, Middle Egyptian. So again, diphthongs and long vowels. Are, are characteristic of Beher. So uh, the Beret branches, they don't have diphthongs. So Middle Egyptian, Zande, and Hasa are characterized by an equal accentuation of the syllables, at, at least the last two, which allows them not only to maintain the consonant, the nasalized uvular trio, which is realized as a flap sound or a nasal in Zande and Hasa, but kept in good condition in Middle Egyptian. Again, this, this sound here is strong in Middle Egyptian and Old Kingdom, but not so in, um, in Late Kingdom in Demotic and Coptic. 
but this is a feature that is uh, basically the uh, an issue for all Bihar languages. So this is how we know it's not an innovation in Coptic because all of the other Bihar languages uh, you know, have this same characteristic. And it's the same thing with this, this uh, homorganic E. It's kept in the Bere branches and especially strong in Bantu, but in none of the Bihar branches. So uh, a good test would be to show all of the E words and compare it to Coptic and then compare it to cognates in Bantu and then in the be in the Bihar, other Bihar branch languages. That will show um, the, the truth of this particular uh, issue right here. So, uh, okay, so I can, hold on, I skipped one. And so here's another characteristic that distinguishes the Bere branch and the Bihar branch is in Middle Egyptian, which is a, a Bere language, there is an absence of words beginning with a vowel because the primary function is, or the primary uh, form of the words are consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, not vowel, consonant, vowel consonant or you know uh and you know they don't primarily deal with uh uh vowel prefixes like that you know um and so if the vowel consonant syllables existed in middle egyptian we should have expected middle egyptian words beginning with the one stroke the two stroke or the three stroke signs the z signs and there are none. And so this is actually a separate argument. And so in M in Boli 2010, he makes the argument that the stroke signs, and this is really only going to be kind of relevant to those of us who actually read the Metanetra script and know kind of what, what I'm talking about here. So you know that there are some words that end uh with the single stroke the double strokes or the triple strokes and what he's arguing is that those actually indicate vowels and because of their placement it demonstrates the consonant vowel consonant vowel structure you know of the words and if the words began with vowels primarily in the uh middle egyptian then we would expect in those instances where the strokes represent vowels that you would see them at the beginning of words and you don't do that or we don't see that so in this upcoming text he said that he is and this is based on the personal communication that he's really expanding on that on that theme and concept and so uh so we'll see more of that. So that's essentially kind of his modern argument. And, and so, you know, I don't have too many examples of that, but that's his argument. So I just wanted to put it out there. But <laughs> this fact joined to the absence of any monoliteral sign having a vowel consonant value in the hieroglyphic sign repertoire actually excludes Middle Egyptian and Old Kingdom from being a Behar language. And this is important. So we get a glimpse of that when we look again at this nasalized uvular trio. Remember, Coptic doesn't have this phoneme, and many of the Behar branches no longer had that at the post-classic stage. So what he says here in terms of Middle Egyptian and nasalized uvular trio, this must correspond to a Remember, this is a type of R sound, R-A, and not A-R. Otherwise, we would not understand this role at the initial position of a word. For example, ra, bird, and then rahata, field, rawa, long, etc., which corresponds to sango, hu, bird, yaka, hiaka, field, yoh, 
or hill, be long, etc. So you would kind of have to to understand that, understand like this is from page 238 of his work where he's showing the correspondences of the uh, how should I say of the nasal eyes of Vular Trio and um, its correspondences with these other you know African languages and so we notice that when, when it corresponds to these other African languages that uh, it is first of all is lost in Coptic for the most part and um, but one could argue that it is, you know, this O is transferred into this O or W in terms of that it, it, it was reduced to a vowel um, or a semi-vowel. But you notice like in Shango, Zande, Hassa, and Somali, they all correspond with a, a, and this, you know, initially was an H, which became palatalized into Y. And so, uh, and this word chomp means field in, in French. And so you see these, these forms here, they're all consonants. They all begin with consonants. And so this would cause some problems, you know? So we know that the hieroglyphic signs, remember that Middle Egyptian, Old Kingdom, that the hieroglyphs does not record the vowels. All of the glyphs, represent consonants and so how they how they came up with the consonant values for each one of these hieroglyphic signs is that they took the first consonant they took the first sound of the word that represented these consonants and that became the consonant used and so we can we can see these correspondences in the sango language here on the right hand side and you notice that they're consonant vowel in, in Sango. And so this says a lot that it couldn't have been a vowel consonant. Why? Because if they were vowel consonant, then all of these symbols would represent vowels because that's the first sound that corresponds to these particular uh, words for the hieroglyphs. So, you know, here's an example here. So this is, again, the nasalized Vular Trio, and this is the hieroglyph for it. And a correspondence in the Yoruba language is Aru, Arawo, vulture. But in Yoruba, they have this, but this is a class prefix. This isn't part of the word, per se, of um, the, the which would be equivalent to the sign. And so this is why we have over here, these other correspondences. And so when we look at, for example, East Cushitic, Raye, Rahaye, Rahaye, Vulture, Rahawa, Large Bird, Proto East Chadic, um, Ray, Vulture, Megama, Raaya, Proto Low East Cushitic, Rahawa, Large Bird, Abaro, Ra, you know, uh, this is, you know, notice that they all start with the this type of R sound as the, the consonant. So it's not vowel consonant, it's consonant vowel. So this, this explains a lot. So this is why we know for a fact that Middle Egyptian does not have a Behar type form. And so, you know, we could take a glimpse of this as far as like hieroglyphic uh, in terms of Nesubiti. So you know, when we examine the word Nesubiti, it is often written as Nesubit without the, the Y. And it is rendering in Akkadian Babylonia as Insabia. This is not compatible with a final consonant. Because remember that uh, the, the hair words end primarily in final consonants and not consonant vowel. And so uh, this in Sabia, this is not compatible with a final consonant pronunciation. They say bit, but fully compatible with a vowel ending pronunciation like in Zande, Gabia, 
king. The T and the Y fused to give out the palato ch that transformed into Y because it is intervocalic. And so the, this Y was the T sound that because it's intervocally, it weakened and um, was palatalized to ch and became Y again. So that's why you had be a king. And this is where you get the word bay. Like when you talk about, you know, you know how going to Moors, we talking about uh, they L bay or whatever It'd be like Tyrone L. Bay, you know, Jonathan L. Bay, Moroccan King L. Bay, you know, whatever. They just put a bay behind everything. But ultimately, what was Turkish Bay, what became Turkish Bay, comes out of these African words for king or ruler, like Ingabaya, king, you know, because it's a word bay is like a word for prince um, uh, or, or somebody you know, of, of high office, you know, uh, something to that nature. <clears throat> so in conclusion, it is true that the Middle Egyptian does not note vowels, but we can analyze vowel impact through comparative works and internal analysis. So it is by the internal analysis of Egyptian and Middle Egyptian that we know it is consonant vowel, consonant vowel, you know, and not simply... Uh, the uh like consonant vowel vowel consonant in terms of its structure and so uh let me see and so like here's you know uh a kind of example you know that there was a prefix like a like an agent prefix that turned the m into w intervocally you could kind of see this uh here I will continue. And so, indeed, if Middle Egyptian behaved like Coptic or Somali, both Bihir languages, then the disappearance of certain vowels, for example, the semi-vowels or, or vowel W or U, E, and Y in Middle Egyptian would have resulted in the emergence of interconsonant, interconsonantal diphthongs uh, of the type V or vowel U or vowel E, like some other vowel in E and some other vowel in U, which the scribes would have noted in terms of the signs. For example, you know, Peru, which would be in PWR. And you actually have some words that have this form. Um, and this lets us know it's like the, the, the Coptic speakers who became scribes were oftentimes doing what we would call in English. For example, when you know English and you know Spanish, that we have this phenomenon called Spanglish. And so in a in a conversation, you'll often hear, you know, especially here in Texas, you'll often hear, you know, Mexicans going back and forth between English and Spanish in the same sentence. You know, and, you know, they'll pronounce certain words, you know, because the Spanish is their first language, you know, they'll pronounce English words in the way that you would in Spanish. So if, if you know, we, if they wrote the way that they talked, you would see, you know, words spelled how they pronounce them, you know, in their Spanglish. And so it's the kind of the same thing uh, in, you know, Egyptian, where you kind of see, uh, <laughs> excuse me, you kind of see the same thing in the Egyptian script. And so now we get to the importance of the suffixes. So we're almost done. And so, again, this is this is meant to be long. And, you know, you have to come back and listen to it in, in different um, in different segments. So what was I just reading here? The importance of suffixes. So how did the, the word bere in the post-classic Negro Egyptian stage 
get pronounced behead. That is because of the role of the suffixes and the accentuation of the suffixes. So, you know, when Mboli was talking about the Kikuki branch, he made these two, there was another one, but I didn't put it up here, but he made these two observations, which I'm going to read right now. So this phenomenon is characteristic of behavior languages in, ter in terms of this phenomenon in linguistics called a blot or apophony. And it's explained by the non-accentuation of the suffixal forms, suffixal forms, which by disappearing, meaning when the suffix is disappeared, they transfer all or part of their vowel characteristics to the previous syllable. But here, each of the three radicals, because we're still we're talking about the Kikuki branch here, syllables can be affected because of their relative form. In extreme cases, this can lead to a semantic type morphology that are found nowhere else where the roots will eventually reduce to their single consonantal skeleton. This is the same phenomenon that is creating forms like sing, sang, and sung in English, um, which are verbs, in, or in the irregular plurals of the English of the type foot or feet. So notice that the vowels change in when we're talking about the, the plural for foot. So you don't say footses, you say feet. But there was a time in English where you said footses. And it is that plural suffix in the disappearance of the consonant and the subsequent, you know, assimilation of the final vowel that we get the word feet. And so we'll show you how that happens a little later. And so in the latter case, and what I'm talking about here, the phenomenon in linguistics is called umlaut. But it always it is always synchronically a vowel alternation in grammatical meaning. That is to say, apophony. So when you change the vowels and the 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 meaning is altered, then you know that is what we call apophony. And so in English, when you see this like a foot or feet type example, we know for a fact that there was some kind of affix that disappeared and affected the internal vowels. So going back to the, you know, the example that we gave earlier. So with Egyptian, this word habesu meaning garment, we see in, in Coptic that it is, and I don't know why the Coptic didn't show up in this form here, but it is pronounced hubus with this long oo here. And so we note that the W in Habesu, which is this form right here, is from this form Kru, vocalized to U at the time of Middle Egyptian. This gives us something like Habesu. Whereas Coptic, again, they lost the nasalized of Ular Trio. <laughs> but lengthen and color the middle vowel to iu or u. So because of the loss of this grammatical feature here, the internal vowel became a long vowel. And this is essentially what, you know, happened in all of these uh, spaces here. And so here's an example in the Somali language for this word, be'il, community. The protoform is reconstructed to baki, kia, because this is a feminine form. So we have this root baki, and then we have this suffix kia, which is the feminine word. It's, it's a literal word meaning, you know, woman that became grammaticalized. And so the Somali language lost this, this feature. But we can tell it's present still based on comparative data. And this is how we can tell the stages. So notice that this root, baki, kia, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, vowel. 
<clears throat> because the K sound is intervocalic between the A ah and the E sound, it weakens to the nasalizer vular trio or R sound. So it's varikia. Then it becomes, the R becomes L. And then because this kia, um, it also reduced to T. So it palatalized into T. So bali ta. So this is the same feature that happened in Egyptian. So you have kia, which became the, the feminine T suffix, but it was ta. And so the bali ta, then this because Somali became um, is a Bihar language, they don't like to end their their words in vowels. So they switched. It's a process we call metathesis. The the word Bali becomes Ba'il Ta, but. There's the consonant cluster. So you say bailita. And so they can't have the the that consonant cluster here. So in terms of a segment of LT. So this is how the the word ta becomes at. So the syllable switch. So now the ta becomes vowel consonant. So this AI. Now, because it's not a true diphthong, it is it's a process of assimilation, and so the A uh, followed by the E sound now it becomes E. So now it becomes belat. And so again, the metathesis of ta to at. And so the final T drops, and then you have bela, but remember that because Somali is a Beher language, it can't end in a vowel. So the same process happens again. The, the, the A uh, it ultimately becomes zero, but it causes this E here to elongate. And so that's how you get um, Bil community from Bakikia. So I hope this is um, making sense if you can follow this evolution here. And so uh, we can conclude from this evolutionary sequence that the Negro Egyptian suffix of the feminine was not accentuated in Proto-Somali and that this, this peculiarity is specific to Bahia languages. The distinction between Bere and Beher languages that we made on purely phonological criteria is thus confirmed by this first study of the comparative grammar. This is all explained by the fact that Beher languages, the accent never fell on the last syllable of the word while the Bere languages behaved contrary. So the reason why you lost this T is because it's not accented. This final suffix it's not accented. So ac unaccented syllables are easy to, to lose in a language. And so this is something that, you know, you have to keep in mind. So it, it no longer, uh, this it lost the, the, the strong consonant. It was left with the vowel. And then the vowel had to disappear because, you know, we can't end in Beher languages. We can't end in vowels. And so that loss uh elongated the e and that's why we got the il and so this is how we got the word behir and all other forms just like that in the, in the same process and so in in english in germanic linguistics this phenomenon is called in umlaut but it's called e umlaut you know when we're dealing with the vowel so why do we say men instead of men menes or two or teeth instead of te toothes, or uh, geese instead of gooses, 
or lice instead of louses, or mice instead of mooses or mouses. We did at one point, but the loss of that that suffix, that plural suffix, uh, caused you know um, the change in the vowel quality, and so this term refers in terms of the i mutation or e umlaut or e mutation or e umlaut. This term refers to changing a back rounded vowel. That is, you know, the o, a, so a, o, you know, um, and this diphthong, au, au, mouse, turn, the, refers to changing the back rounded vowel, o or u, to corresponding front rounded vowels, oi or yi, in anticipation of a front vowel. E or A in the next syllable. So, like we take the word, you know, why you say geese instead of gooses. And so, at one time, gooses actually existed as a word. And so, the loss of the S changed the, the long U or O into OE by umlaut in terms of the plural. So you had go o -si. the The E after the final consonant um, forced the OE to change to E. So that's how we say instead of gooses, um, we say geese, long E's. So the final E goes silent. And so the by assimilation, the the rounded O's are trying to sound more like the anticipated front vowels, which is the E or E. And so the great vowel shift in Germanic, you know, raised all long vowels, one not. So we say goose instead of ghost. Uh, or gulses, we say gooses, and you know, and so we have geese as the final vowel. <laughs> Excuse me, as the uh, the final rendering in terms of the plural. And so it's the same thing that happens with the word foot or feet. So you know, in, in the original Proto-Germanic, it was uh, foots. And then the plural was fotis. And then we have foot. And then foti, because remember, just like in this previous example, we lost the Z. And so actually, the plural in English is Z. And there are restricted uh, instances where it is actually the S sound. But we use the S when we write the plural, but the plural in English is Z, a Z, as we like to say. And so we lost the Z, so it's footy in terms of the plural. And so the loss of I, remember, after the foot forces the, the alt to we go OE, or this diphthong, and then it becomes feet as a result of the uh, trying to anticipate the front vowel at the end, which was lost. And so it goes through the same process. So, you know, again, English behaves like a beheaded language. But just showing you all of this to show that the, the suffixes help us to understand the nature of the changes of the vowels and the forms here. So, the the unaccentuation of the final suffix forces the main root to be shaped like this and it's the same thing in the behar languages as far as the the um uh african languages so one could ask well could it be that the middle egyptian which was a better language just evolved into a Behar language? It is highly unlikely because there's no reason 
for the language to change if, you know, left to its own devices. However, it could change as a result if there was another Beher language around and that was the prestige language. And you would find in the in the case of, for example, Middle Egyptian speakers trying to pronounce and uh, pronunciate and learn words from a Beher language. So let's just say it was the opposite. Say that the Coptic speakers landed in the Nile and it was the Middle Egyptian speakers um, who, you know, were the lower caste. You would see the Beher, the Bere language trying to be more like the Beher Coptic language. But that's not the case because in, in real life, it is the Bere speakers that were the powerful ones who their language uh, was the prestige language. So you have the Coptic speakers trying to sound like the Middle Egyptian speakers. And, and so this is how you start to see some of the shapings of the Coptic language trying to emulate the, the Middle Egyptian uh, and, and why there's a lot of borrowings and stuff there. And so uh, this little section here is just what I call the external influence, you know, idea. And so in uh, dealing with contact induced change. And so if you know anything about the Germanic languages, the Germanic languages also uh, evolve from a contact situation. And so as I, you know, ask the question here, which I just asked, is could the differences between Coptic and Middle Egyptian simply be explained by natural evolution of language change? Is there evidence of early dialects or another language present in the Old Kingdom of Middle Egyptian literature that would support our thesis? And so, you know, I, I'm giving you this idea here. And, you know, you really have to purchase this book and read it because it is, it, it is very dense. Um, in terms of information, but it, it provides you a, an example that you can go back and test with Middle Egyptian and Coptic. And so with this, this book here written by Peter Shriver um, is, is called Language Contact and the Origins of the Germanic Languages. And so on page 197, you know, he kind of summarizes and says that the Germanic is a separate branch of Indo-European that arose as a result of contact between Balto-Finnic, more particularly probably as a result of Indo-European Finno-Samic bilingualism and a subsequent switch to the Indo-European, which as a result became Germanic. And so what, what this text tells you is that there is a separate language family in what is now modern Europe that they call the Finno-Samic. And when some unknown branch of Indo-European traveled along the lines of uh, the, the Finno-Samic uh, people, and more specifically the balto finnic people, that the, you know, how should I say, the what would eventually become Proto-Germanic, those Proto-speakers were the prestige and powerful people. They were the people of influence and, you know, uh, of, of tutorship for the balto people. Because the balto people, the argument is that they were still mainly hunter-gatherers in this region. Now, the Indo-European speakers who moved in this direction were farmers. And because they had a different and more prestigious lifestyle, they influenced the balto finnic speakers in a way that the balto finnic speakers adopted the Indo-European language, but they kept their... Uh, certain grammatical and pronunciations 
and phonology of the Balto-Finnic language, this unknown language because of so long ago before written history. And it is that interaction between those two because there was bilingualism going on and then the adoption of uh, Proto-Indo-European that evolved into Proto-Germanic and Germanic itself. And so the Indo-European would have stayed along its, its normal trajectory, but because it interacted with the balto finnic that's when the Indo-European changed into Proto-Germanic. So this text gives you kind of a context for why you can never say like Indo-European would have never evolved into the Germanic languages on its own. Only as a result of interacting with another language family and its bilingualism and adoption and, and, and things of this nature does Indo-European alter a bit and becomes the Germanic languages. And so this is important. So it would have had to have been the same thing for Coptic. Coptic, um, like in terms of Middle Egyptian, Middle Egyptian would not evolve into Coptic by itself because it's two different strategies in terms of word formation, in terms of grammar and everything. And so if, if that was the case, then we have to wonder, well, what is this prestige language that would have affected Middle Egyptian so much that it evolved into Coptic? And there's no history to support such a thing. And so, uh, what do we have here? Just as the consonant shift in the profound transformation of the vowel system, this fact, therefore the replacement of the free tonal accent by word initial intensity stress, indicates external influence. Uh, this is a type of pronunciation that is alien to Indo-European. So, uh, Antoine Millet is is talking about germanic here and so he's saying that you know just exactly what i i was saying right now he's and i'll read it again just as the consonant shift and the profound transformation of the vowel system this fact therefore the replacement of free tonal accent by word initial intensity stress indicates external influence this is a type of pronunciation that is alien to Indo-European. It was introduced by the population that had learned to speak the dialect, which had become Germanic. So he's showing you here that, again, Indo-European would have been on a, uh, a, a, a different trajectory in terms of these pronunciations, but it's by external influence that it changed. And so it's not an end, it's not even an indication really here that it was an external influence into the language. It is really, as the the author discusses in the text, is really the native Balto uh, uh, or Finno Baltic speakers who adopted the Indo-European language and changed it. You know. Um, instead of the Indo-European speakers, uh, you know, being influenced by the, the Finno-Baltic people. It's the Finno-Baltic people who adopted the Indo-European language, this unknown Indo-European language, and changed it drastically. And that's what became the, uh, the uh, Germanic languages. It's just like with the French, the Francs you know, which were Celtic speakers and uh, who adopted Latin and because they adopted Latin but kept their way of pronunciation and, and certain internal deep structures in terms of grammar and stuff like this that changed it and became French. So, you know, this is how this stuff works. So it's a lot of work that has to be done before you can make the argument that Coptic is the last stage of Egyptian. And so, um, so here's another feature, uh, and I'm, you know, we will be ending on this. 
on Middle Egyptian that lets us know that Coptic is not derived from um, Middle Egyptian, um, you know, via Debotic and, and New Kingdom. And <laughs> so we, we go back to, you know, Karsten Pust and an introduction to phonology of a dead language. And so, you know, uh, in the introduction, he makes this statement. I have discussed here the different representations of small linguistic elements, phonemes, graphemes, and spoken and written Egyptian, respectively. Camazal makes it clear that spoken Egyptian and written Egyptian can actually be considered two distinct linguistic systems. So remember, for Pust, the, the people spoke Coptic, or what you know was known as Coptic, but the um, the writing system, the hieroglyphic system, is a different system. So he's arguing, you know, he's arguing along those lines. So that the written Egyptian uh, is can actually be considered. Excuse me, let me back up a bit. Camerzel makes it clear that e spoken Egyptian and written Egyptian can actually be considered two distinct linguistic systems since they showed marked differences on all levels in linguistic description, including morphology, syntax, and pragmatics, which is a clear sign to me that these are different languages. It is a striking fact that spoken Egyptian was a highly inflectional language, whereas written Egyptian can be described as a basically agglutinative system. And so, uh, Middle Egyptian and Bantu share the agglutinative process, the word formation in terms of their words. And so I give an example in the book. This is one of the examples. So remember that, well, I should say, if I didn't say it before, that the Egy Middle Egyptian is built from a consonant vowel monoradical, and that every other quote unquote consonant that you see in the the writing script is actually an affix to the root. So we have this root, this monoradical root, this consonant vowel root, j. We'll just we'll pronounce it as j for the moment. And this is a word on the top row for body parts. It's just a word for body. And then you have this body suffix. This this T, jata, is a suffix for body parts. And um, it's also the, the uh, diverbative T suffix uh, and nominalizing, you know, uh, suffix, which have kind of merged. And so you have this concept of the jet, body, or jata, surf. You know, which is a a an able working body. Then you have this variation, W N J W T, which is a word for people. And so you have an agent prefix W. You have another agent prefix N. Then you have the plural suffix W, and then you have the collective plural T. These are all consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel formation of the words, all built from this mono radical. We can do the same thing with this form here Reggie, to give, to set, to place. The R is a prefix. The, the E, the, this sound here, is a suffix. We know that because they are both eliminated. And then a new suffix, the deverbative T here, now makes this into a noun meaning gift. So a gift is something that you have given to somebody. You have placed in their hands. And now with new prefixes and suffixes, this same root becomes a word for offerings something that you give somebody. So again, agent prefix, agent prefix, uh, 
there's a plural suffix w and this other w here is the abstract so it serves as a replacement for this t in terms of offerings coptic does not build its words there's no reason for middle egyptian to stop forming its words like this it will continue to do it until the middle egyptian speakers adopt another language and adopt a different grammar this is a totally different word developing process in middle egyptian than exists in coptic two separate ways of doing this same thing here there's another agent prefix or verbal prefix j to burn to roast that is dropped and this suffix here nominalizes it to a fire drill same root same word this does not exist in coptic and if you see words like this that exist in coptic this is how you know they borrowed it from middle egyptian because you cannot break it down in Coptic the way that you can in Middle Egyptian. This is why you can't use Middle Egyptian to try to pronunciate words in Middle Egyptian. Excuse me, you can't use Coptic. Yeah, I don't know how I said that, but I'm gonna restate it. You can't use Coptic to figure out how to pronounce words in Middle Egyptian because they're totally different grammars. They're totally different word structures. You'll never get it looking at Coptic. So look at this form here, um, Jata or Jete, flood. The T is dropped, a W prefix, an agent prefix is, is put in front of it. So now it's a body of water. And then you have this verbal suffix here, meaning to flood, that makes it to flood. And then it is suffixed with the abstract W here. So now it means flood. So check out this other formation here in this word canal. See a different suffix here. So you can see that this root, this monosyllabic root, is the foundation for, and, and these are different words here. I'm not saying that all of these are the same words. I'm just using this as an, this, this one sign here as an example so when we're talking about cattle it's built from a monosyllabic root how can we tell so we see this word here so this w is a plural for cattle or a collective and then you have this other age prefix that changes it to goats and then you have this other format here for cattle and herd and so when you understand what I'm saying here, this is a totally different language than Coptic. You, you be hard pressed. Anybody who is listening to this and, and can, can read Coptic, show me where you have this agglutinative word structure in Coptic. It doesn't exist. And you would not find, you will find this in better languages, not in Beher languages. So we do the same thing, and I won't go through all of these, but I'll show you that that the, the j and the ch sound, you know, the word unk is also built from a monosyllabic root. I go through this extensively in Aluja Volume 2. And so there's a, 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 a noun class prefix here, and then this agent prefix here. And so you can see here, I didn't even include this word, sejem, servant, with an M suffix. And so let's go to this row three here. Sejem, to hear, to listen. But you have hajat, he, he who hears well. Same root, but different prefixes and suffixes. Middle Egyptian is a mono-radical language with prefixes and suffixes. So there's no such thing as a triliteral in Middle Egyptian. It is a monoliteral with a prefix and a suffix to the root. 
And so, you know, uh, Mboli, you know, demonstrates that Middle Egyptian is, and, and just Negro Egyptian itself, is a language of classes. There are no classes in Coptic. Coptic lost all classes. And so this explains why there's a difference when you read the Egyptological literature on the difference between Middle Egyptian, Late Egyptian, and Coptic, why the grammar and the syntax and morphology is so different. Because they're two separate languages. And so, you know, uh, that's basically, you know, saying the end of the presentation. So one, two, three, basically ended three hours and 10 minutes. So, uh, again, this is something that you're going to have to go back through and, and, and listen and, you know, look at the, you know, pause the screens. Uh, and you know, and examine, look at look at the difference of the words. And so again, I go into more detail and, and, and show you examples in Aluja Volume Two and in the Towards a Comparative Dictionary of Chikam in Modern African Languages text. But you know, hopefully all of this helps you to understand the difference between, you know, saying uh, and this is just on the vocabulary and the word structures between Middle Egyptian and Coptic. And um, <laughs> so with that said, I will stop sharing my screen. So if, you know, I'll take a few questions if any of y'all have them, you know, otherwise I will end this because it's already been three hours. Uh, again, this is a, a, a full class, and so it's intended for anyone to, uh, you know, it's intended for everyone to come back and, you know, look at it in, in terms of different segments uh, or whatnot. So I uh, haven't been paying too much to the chat, but I'm going to see if there's any worthy comments. Um Tristan asked, could Coptic, being that of Greek characters were introduced, could Coptic be an Ebonics version of what that distinct Rani Kimmick Bahir language? <laughs> well, the script itself wouldn't necessarily uh, warrant that, but as Pew said earlier, I cited, you know, the Coptic language at least for him, is considered a mixed language. So, it, you know, you could consider it any bonics and things, but that wouldn't have that wouldn't necessarily have anything to do with the script itself, because you can substitute any script, and but that wouldn't have any bearing on the the structure of the language itself. So, uh. Um, let me see. Um, and you know, could Coptic be considered a Creole in that sense or an Ebonics? Um, again, you know, you'll have to go back and, and find that citation where, you know, the author calls it a mixed language. Um, uh, but you know, from Mboli's standpoint, that you know, Coptic, it again, it borrowed a lot from neighboring languages, and and especially from Mid Eastern and and Greek. But its structure, it behaves like the typical Bihar language, and so you know that's why, you know, it, it's 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 like English, you know, regardless when we start looking at the basic vocabulary of English and we start looking at the grammar and syntax of English, it's clear that it is a Germanic language, although it has a large amount of borrowings in terms of the vocabulary from other languages like French, Greek, and Latin. 
And so um, that may be the case even with Coptic, that Coptic has just borrowed a lot of vocabulary from Middle Egyptian and neighboring languages. Uh, but the structure of it and its grammar still fits in alignment with the Beher branch and those other languages that it constitutes it as not some kind of you know hybrid in the, in a sense but it's still a a a Beher language within the negro egyptian uh context and model and let me see uh Any thoughts on changing the name of Coptic? People hear Coptic and they think it's near with Greek script being new instead of a continuation from lower Egyptian language. Um, no, there's no reason to change, you know, Coptic, uh, the word for it. You know, it's just more so if, if one is going under the model of Imboli, understanding that Coptic is just a separate language. It's just like, as, as I stated earlier, with French and, and, and English. The French came and invaded the, the British Isle. The dominant language at the time that they were ruling was French. And so the, the, the writing was French. The, the prestige language, the language of learning was French. So everyone had to learn French if they were to be of importance in that society. So you had bilingual English and French speakers. But once the French were kicked out, the native language of English became the prestige language. So now they're writing and doing everything in English. And so but French is still a related language to English. They just belong to two separate branches of Indo-European. So you have the Germanic branch on this one end, and then you have the Romance languages on the other one coming out of Latin. Two separate branches, all in terms of its speakers, who all lived in one area, the British Isles. And because they were in contact with each other for for a good you know a few hundred years, you you have this influence of French, not in not only in terms of vocabulary but in terms of pronunciation. And we've even adopted some gr some grammar from from French and Latin. We borrowed some of their grammar. And so, um, so we have to keep you know that in mind. So that's what that's what we're arguing essentially, you know, happened in the Nile Valley. The old kingdom, Middle East uh, kingdom speakers, the the Middle Egyptian language speakers, they were the invaders. They invaded the native folks who lived there already. Their language was the prestige language. So at this time, from the Old Kingdom into the, the 18th Dynasty, that was the dominant language. But then it switched. And the, the New Kingdom language was the prestige language. And then it evolved from there. The original Middle Kingdom speakers didn't rise again after that point. Just like the French have not risen again in terms of the British Isles. So we have to keep that uh, in mind. <laughs> So, uh, Five Lightning Tis asks, my question is, what is the goal of these linguistics comparisons? What are you specifically driving home in the comparative linguistic field 
with all of this for the record. <laughs> the, the goal simply first and foremost is to better understand ancient Egyptian language and culture. So it's from that initial inquiry that this becomes important. And so in this, and, and I should say this about Mboli. So he says this in the text and he says this personally, that when he started his research, he believed what the consensus believed, that Coptic, was the last stage of a language continuum. But as a result of the rigorous comparative method and actually doing the work, he hesitantly had to go with his evidence that demonstrated that uh, Middle Egyptian was a totally separate branch than Coptic. So this all comes as a result of some very detailed work. And so what I did here does not do justice to the, remember in Boley's book is 630 30 pages long in terms of analysis. So, you know, what I gave you in these three hours was nothing. You know, there's, there's a lot of other stuff that you have to consider, but I tried to break it down at least this simply so you at least understand the fundamentals of the argument. And so this lets us know a little bit about the history of ancient Egypt. So you can you know a lot of history when you start studying languages in terms of their thought process, their inner logic, their motivations behind certain <coughs> ways of expression in terms of religion, you know, culture, motifs, all of that is, you know, dealing with the study of languages. And so this, you know, is, is really groundbreaking in terms of understanding ancient Egyptian. And so uh, this was just a byproduct of just simply trying to understand the relationship between Egyptian and modern African languages. That's all it was. So, you know, we... We do this for a number of reasons, some just out of pure academic inquiry, some to demonstrate if there's any demonstrable evidence that there's a relation, there's a historical relationship. So we're trying to reconstruct African history. And so you reconstruct it by use of archaeology, by use of DNA, by linguistics, and you try to use all of that to kind of paint a, a general picture of the origins and the movements of African people throughout time. And so this is just, linguistics is just one of those tools. And so it says, also, how do you feel this will specifically help the African community once it's widely known? What do you want or believe it can achieve for our people worldwide? Um, it may mean nothing to people worldwide, but what it can do is, again, it's about history. And to, to tell you, for example, what happens when you have a prestige group who takes over, you know, an, an area uh, with a, I, I don't want to say a, a, a non-prestigious group, but just another group that becomes a low. So this, this information tells you about how uh, human groups interact in a colonial context. And so, but as I stated earlier, linguistics helps you to find out about the psychology of a people. And so this is a part of what they call linguistics, historical comparative linguistics especially, but linguistics in general is part of what we call the neurosciences because it is dealing with your neurological faculties and helping you to understand these in, in very critical ways. So if you want to understand African people, you got to understand their languages. And some of us go deeper into the languages to show the relationships because we're answering questions of history. For example, there are some people in West Africa 
who who argue and claim that they originate out of the Sudan or um, Egypt. Well, how could we prove that? You know, we can look for artifacts, but we have to be realistic about artifacts. How many artifacts could they travel with? You know, but one of the ways that you can tell if there was any interactions between the ancestors of the modern people in these respective locations and the ancient Egyptians, if they were not the Egyptians themselves, is to look at the language. And so you have to look at it deeply. How can we tell that, that you know, the, the Wolof speakers who, according to their history, derive in six migrations um, to West Africa and Senegal? Well, the way that you can tell is, is looking at the languages. You know, is, is Wolof a, a branch of ancient Egyptian or was Wolof a separate language? that they became bilingual speakers in Egypt, the, the, the proto Wolof, and uh, they adopted a lot of Egyptian words. If they adopted a lot of Egyptian words, we should be able to tell by way of historical comparative linguistic methods. So this is how this stuff becomes important. And we're also involved in the project in terms of vocalizing the ancient Egyptian, Middle Egyptian language and to use it as a classical language in the same way that Europeans use Latin or Greek as a classical language. And so we have two languages in our Pan-African uh, ideal and, and, and mission, and that is Kiswahili in terms of a modern living language and ancient Egyptian as our classical language. Those be the two languages that are required from everybody to learn, to be able to communicate with each other. So this is something that has been taught. So this, you know, the study of ancient Egyptian, this information is, is critical to the revitalization of the ancient Egyptian language itself. So when you understand that Coptic and Middle Egyptian are two different languages, you won't waste your time trying to argue that you know we can use Coptic to vocalize Middle Egyptian because it's two different languages, two different word structures. So we have to use a different process. And so let me see. Is this Coptic? It's weird for me, and I know it's really weird for others. There you can call it old school. Actually, I think there is already is an old Coptic um, addressing forty-two tribes. Uh, he says, I get it, but it's weird to picture. I could just post it. Uh, he says, I get it, but it's weird to picture 3000 BC Egyptians speaking Coptic. That's because you're picturing Coptic in its modern form. And so it wouldn't be in its modern form. The, the argument is, is that Coptic is the natural evolution of the new kingdom language, which, which became apparent in the 19th in terms of a full system, uh, a full systematic language became apparent in the 19th dynasty. Uh, this is the dynasty of Ramis, the, the Ramesses. And so, but the as I discussed throughout the text, I don't know, excuse me, throughout the lecture, I don't know if you were here since the beginning, but the, the quote unquote new kingdom language was, was spoken in the times of the old kingdom and middle kingdom but of the lower class. And so who were the lower class? Those indigenous people of the Nile Valley who the old kingdom and middle kingdom uh, language speakers, you know, um, we don't know if it's a, you know, an actual invasion, like a, just a warring invasion, or if they just created a system to where they were the rulers and everyone agreed to be a part of this uh, confederacy, so to speak. But they were just the ruling class. So there's many possibilities there. But you know, this is something that I discussed at the beginning of the program, that the new, what was considered the new kingdom language was already in existence in the old kingdom. And as Car Carson Pust uh, demonstrated in his text, that 
this language, which was the quote unquote new kingdom language, that is the evidence for it in the old kingdom, for example, with the uh, the definite, he's using one example in terms of the definite article, it was only uh, recorded in reference to when people were recording live the, the speech of the lower class individuals. So it's telling you there that the lower class individuals, not the, the, the upper class, were speaking new kingdom. So whether you call it new kingdom or Coptic, Coptic is the last stage of New Kingdom, but Coptic is not the last stage of Middle Egyptian. And so I hope that makes sense. Let's see. Let see. Yeah, so again, you know, people just got to understand that when we're talking about separate language here, uh, that you know it's just two different from two different branches of the same language family so how much does old kingdom let me see what he's saying here how much does old kingdom egyptian and middle kingdom egyptian differ is there enough evidence to demonstrate whether old kingdom egyptians and middle kingdom egyptians spoke the same language yes there is and again you will have to get this text here um or you can get uh, this text here, but um, Nesubiti. But the the introduction to here is also in here. So, uh, but there's some changes that I added to that introductory dialogue um, based on the the latest work. So this work came out in 2016. And this came out of January this year, and this came out like in March, April of this year. So, you know, so I combine some of the stuff that I talk about in here uh, in terms of certain corrections, like the whole chin into and stuff like that in in here. So I, I re put the intro from here in here with the changes from the discussion of the text from here. So it, it's, you'll get the citations and things when you read uh, this. Um, so it says, I wonder if you had a similar invasion scenario with Narmer and a transition from pre-dynastic to old kingdom. That, that would be the, the same group. Of folks, so it's, it's believed that those people are the ones who who invaded, and um, you know, impose their their language and culture on the folks, you know, who were in the Middle Nile and the Delta. And so, yeah, if that's it. I don't want to be too, too long and make this video too, too long here. So uh, I appreciate everyone for listening. Of course, you can continue to ask questions in the comment section. And I will do my best to try to answer everyone, you know, there if you continue to have questions. But again, remember, you can purchase in Boley's book if you read French to, to get the full analysis and then, but if you want a good summary in English, you'll you'll have to purchase my text. And so, again, um, towards the comparative dictionary of Chicam in modern African languages, and Aluja Volume Two, China into Religion and Philosophy. And this again on Amazon right now is forty five dollars, but if you go to my website, it's thirty dollars on sale right now. So get it while you can if you don't have it already. So with that said, I appreciate everyone for listening and supporting the channel. So continue to support the channel. And we will be back on, we'll probably be back before then, but definitely on Monday, July the 6th 
at 10 a.m. We have Hermel Hermstein, who's going to be talking about his book series, uh, Black Sumer. So, you know, uh, set your reminder. The show is already, you know, up. So, you know, you can go to my channel, set your reminder. So to make sure that you get the notice and, you know, we will go from there. So as usual, this is my contact information. If you want to support the channel, there's, uh, you know, say in a cash app or you can put something via the chat and, you know, we'll be bringing some more big names uh, for the channel. So I appreciate you all. And until next time.